Okay, well, welcome to our fresh class today. We're going to finish off the very end of the last chapter. Please have your Dave Duncan file open, and we're going to go from there. I'm going to finish off the few things that I wasn't able to demonstrate last class. Then we're going to review the practice problems, and there will be a few poll questions to see if you have thought about your answers very carefully, and then we'll take a break, and then we're going to jump into our next chapter. So bear with me while I share my screen here. And I already have my DT Max open. And just a quick reminder, when you're in DT Max, if you want to find a file, there are lots of different ways to find it. You can find things alphabetically. You can search for your client. So if I'm looking for Dave Duncan, I can type in part of his name. For my convenience today, I'm going to resort by client number because I have organized my clients into chapters. But if you want to sort them another way, you can always sort in any of the columns here just by clicking on the column. And you can search under different functions as well. So you can find a client by searching name, but if that's not convenient, you can search by social insurance number and other methods. So I'm going to sort my list here so that I have my Dave Duncan file plus all my chapters chapter 17 in one. And you may find that helpful as well. If you are doing them in order, your client numbers, in your case as students, will be in order, so that might be a useful function for you. Just a quick reminder of what we did get done on Dave Duncan. So for Dave, we had a T4, which we entered for him in 2021. We had done his 2020 return first, then he came back to see us the next year. We updated his personal information entered his new T4. He did have some EI as well. And because he had moved and he moved for a new job and he moved far enough and the move was closely related timing wise, we did moving expenses for him. And we noticed when he did the move that we had to ask, did you sell any property? And he's going to say, well, I sold my home before I moved here. And then the next thing that we said is we need to do a principal residence designation. Quick reminder on your principal residence designation for the years. This is something that a lot of people find confusing, so I do want you to refer to your Inkling textbook for reminders for how to do this. The designation must always be period after 1971 to current year, not the other option, which is designate the year zero. Always want to give specific dates. So that's going to give us the option of saying from the year that he bought the property originally, to the year before this year. He sold it this year, you're going to designate it to the year before that. So for our Dave Duncan file, it will designate from 2015 to 2020, and that lets us use the plus one rule in the most effective manner. Okay. There are lots and lots of things on here that you are not going to enter. So when you're dealing with capital gains data entry, there are whole different categories of data that we have to track depending on what type of assets have been sold and whether or not they're taxable. So you're going to notice as we get into the more difficult types of data entry, there will be lots of things you need to leave blank. If you don't know what the file does or what a box does, don't put anything in it. If you think you might need it and you're not sure, you can always check your warnings because your warnings will tell you if there's something that is mandatory you haven't done. And you can check the tax return. So before you enter data, check the tax return, see if it looks the way you want it to look. And then finally, if you still think it's something that I need to enter and you're not sure, remember that there is a help function. So if you go to any keyword and you want to know what that keyword means or what it's for, maybe I want to know what date of disposition is, if I hover over the top, it'll give me a little bit of information. It'll say date of disposition of person who's property. And then if I right click on it and I choose help, or control F8 if you like key, uh, automatic keys, you can then get more information in the help field that tells you date of acquisition, enter the date of acquisition of the property that was sold, so what is the day you purchased it, and it'll tell you why you need it and how to deal with it. You might have noticed when you did your date of disposition for Dave and then your date of acquisition that the computer calculated how many days there are between that. We don't need that number for anything for this type of property, but the computer will fill that in. So I know a lot of times I get to this and then students say, how did I know that it was 2,105 days? I didn't. The computer did. It will fill that box in for me and I don't need to do anything with it. 
Okay. And if he sold a home and he moved, in real life, what else should we be thinking of? So we did his moving expenses. He put in his U-Haul trailer. He put in his vehicle. He put in his hotel bills. What else could we put in for him as a moving expense, knowing that he sold his home? legal fees, and various other things related to that. So a lot of times clients don't know that there's information that you could use if you don't ask them. So in this case, in real life, we'd be looking for the selling cost. And if you want to know what you can claim for selling cost, the drop-down box will give you an idea. So you can ask him, what was the real estate commission? Did you have legal fees? You can double check your T1M and see what's entitled for that. And then if he did have information here, he had sold an old home and he bought a new home, it will open up a new box that will allow him to put his new purchase of the home in as well. So sometimes something from the client will trigger one question, which will trigger another question, which will trigger another one. Make sure you're thinking of the tax return as a whole thing and think of all the places where it might be relevant because we can get tunnel vision a little bit. We get one thing entered and we go, oh good, we did the principal residence, and then we forget to do the extra expenses here. Okay. So the one thing other than that that I missed, I'm not gonna enter them for this one just because I don't have any made up numbers for you. We're gonna leave it as is. We're gonna say, oh, he got rid of all his paperwork and he's getting so many moving expenses, he doesn't care about the rest of it. In real life, this is an expensive thing, so your client would go find it for you. But for today, we're going to leave it at that. I'm going to add the one more thing, which I did not include last week, which is working from home. So a question which in 2020, we asked our clients, did you work from home and told them that there was a tax credit and they weren't aware that there was one? I'll tell you for now, everyone who's ever worked from home has figured out that there is a tax credit for that and they're going to ask if they can get it again this year. For 2021, what is the maximum number of days that he could have worked from home to get credit for it on the tax return? Does anyone remember? 250. So if, if Dave had a new job, we're going to say, how many days did you work from home? And we're going to figure that out. Again, every client is going to say, I worked from home the whole year. That's the answer they're going to give you. I worked from home the whole year. Remember, you have to dig a little bit to say, how many days a week did you work? Do you work on statutory holidays? Did you take any vacation last year? What were the dates of your vacation? You're going to have to dig into that a little bit. Let's say for Dave, he says, I worked from home a few days because of COVID, because I wasn't well and I had to stay home. And you're going to say, how many days was that? He's going to say, I worked from home for 20 days. If he worked from home for 20 days, do you think he's going to do better doing the flat rate method or the detailed method? Do I want to get a copy of his utility bills for the entire year and everything like that printed out for 20 days? Probably not. Flat rate method is going to be convenient and simple, but I'm going to show you how to do both in case you end up needing to do both. That being said, in a real life scenario, if you're into detailed method and you're a little bit nervous about how to do that data entry, that's a good time to find a senior associate who's more comfortable with employment expenses because they do that all the time. If you're doing flat rate method, it's gonna be very easy. So we have to add working from home data entry options to the computer. Again, if you use your Smart Start, I want to remind you, it's mostly in the order of the tax return. You're gonna have income first, and then after you have income, you're going to get to the part where you have deductions. So if you go just below where we had moving expenses, you're going to find employment expenses listed there. So you can tick that box and hit continue. Or if you want a keyword, keyword in this case, I believe, is going to be T777S. And if I do that, it's going to pull up three options for me where I can pre-select what I want it to be do I want the flat rate or detailed salary or detailed commission? This one you have to be careful with because if you don't get the T word right and you do a T777, it's going to take you to the right place, but you're going to notice you have a lot more options. 
Okay, so if you're looking for the wrong form and you're not sure of the difference between a T777 or a T777S, you might make the wrong selection. If you make the wrong selection, you're going to have the wrong form. So everyone should now open it up. I'm going to show you the detailed method first, but I'm not going to have you actually do that one. Just to see what it looks like. If you're doing the detailed method, you need quite a bit of information. Uh, and I'm going to do detailed method for salaried employee. It's rare in this circumstance that you would do detailed method for commissioned employee. You need to know the extra information connected to that. So I would say that would go to a senior associate. But you'll notice if you're doing the detailed method, you have quite a bit more information that needs to be filled in. You're going to have the employer, the date that you were working for that employer. You're going to have the title, the duties. You need the expenses. You're entitled to supplies. And then if you have home expenses, you're going to have to enter heat, electricity, internet, whatever you have receipts for for the whole year. And then it's going to be asking for how much of the home is being used personally. So not how much of the home is being used for business. This is one that people always get backwards, how much the home is being used personally. So if we've done all of our calculations out and we've decided that 10% because they have a private home office that is only used for that, 10% of their home is used for business, then we would say home own use is 90%. You're going to enter all your expenses in, and then the computer will calculate what is the allowable portion. And the way it works on the tax form is the computer will calculate the full year, and then it will subtract the personal use portion, which is why that number goes that way. And again, anytime you have to do something and you're not sure what it's asking for, when it says home own use, what do they mean? Is that business use or personal use? If you choose the help for the keyword, it gives you a bit more detail. It's the percentage of the home that is not used by the taxpayer for employment. So it's the personal side. All right, I'm going to take that out because most of the time you're not going to be doing the detailed method. I'm going to go back in there and we're going to say instead let's do temporary flat rate. So I want everyone to pick T777S, temporary flat rate, it is now going to say, were they qualified for this? Did they have to work from home because of COVID? And did they do enough days in a row? Remember, you have to have done a certain period of time in a row in order to qualify for this. We're going to say yes. The next thing it's going to say is, how many days did you work from home? This is going to have a little red star on it. With a red star, it means once I've opened up this form, it won't generate a tax return until I give it an answer. So if we've decided that he worked four consecutive weeks, five days a week, because of COVID, we're going to say 20 days. I'm going to put the 20 in there. And that's all you have to enter for your data entry for working from home. So if we've done all of that, we're going to go to the tax return now, and we're going to see what the final answer for Dave Duncan is. Okay. Go to the return. Make sure it did what I wanted it to do. I'm going to go look for the detailed method and the deduction for moving expenses. My moving expenses are here. My working from home employment expenses is going to get $40 there. And you can see it's also going to generate for me a schedule, statement of employment expenses for working from home. He doesn't need to do anything except keep this, but I would recommend that he make sure he makes a note of which days he worked from home, because we haven't seen a lot of audits on these right now, but we are expecting to see audits on them in the next couple of years. They're starting to be audited, because the CRA has a bit more time for that now, so clients are not going to remember three years from now which, week, which month they worked from home necessarily or which dates they worked from home. Have him make his notes now and just stick them in the tax file so if he gets asked on it, he has that data to prove. All right, and let's see what the final result is. We have gone from him having a very, very small refund to having a much, much larger refund. Give me a green check mark if you have the same refund that I have. And give me a red X if you have a different one. All right, I've got two people. Let's 
three people. So there's a few more things that I want to show you. Oh, Marie, so the help button isn't working in your program. Um, if you're having an issue like that, what I would say is um, send me a screenshot of what you are, um, of what you're looking at, because it should work for most, but it may be a question of how you're accessing it. So just a reminder, you can always access the help button from the data entry screen, but you have to have selected the line that you want help for. So if I'm opening up this section and I want help for, which one am I going to open up? I'm going to open up my moving expenses and I want help for a specific line. Um, I might do other costs. And if I do right click, right click on it, you should be able to do help. And it should open up another box. There's one other thing that might happen is if you have turned off pop-up, access to pop-up um, windows somewhere on your computer, it may be blocking it from opening a new window. Um, so you may have to look at your, your administrative settings for that. Because it does open in a new window. Okay, I've got a handful of people in the same place, which is good. I want to show a few more things that we didn't talk about last week when we have multiple years, because this is really, really wonderful. When you get to the end of the tax return, we're going to talk about this today, you always want to make sure you can explain why someone is getting a refund or why someone owes. And that can be extra helpful if we can see what had happened the year before. So we have a method in our tax returns to see everything in a summarized format and also to compare it to previous years. So I'm going to show you both of those things now. As I do, I want to remind you that there are lots of pieces of information up at the top on the left side that you should be using all the time. Notes and diagnostics. I would like to make sure everyone notices their notes and diagnostics should be the first thing you check. Make sure you've cleared your warnings, that there are no warnings. You are always going to see one warning that says ineligible for federal e-file because we've turned e-filing off. In an actual office setting, you want to make sure it says eligible for e-file because if it doesn't, you have to fix it. We should be e-filing most, if not all, of our returns. So if it says ineligible for e-file in an office setting, it means you have a problem you have to fix. And then you want to make sure you don't have any other warnings that are telling you that you should pay attention to something or you're missing information or a calculation isn't making, making sense. This will be the page that saves you from making errors before you submit it to the CRA. There are a few other things down here. One of them that I want you to notice is what we usually send to our clients, which is a tax return summary. We have a summary of everything on the tax return, but instead of flipping through every page and every schedule, we put it all in one place. So we will have his personal information on the right side. We'll have his tax return here, and you can see they're just going to pull out the lines that are important and the ones that we have entered. So I can see that for Dave, I had employment income. There was some EI income from him. He had registered pension plan. He had moving expenses. He had other employment expenses from the amount. I would know that that was from his working from home. And then it's going to show me his credits that we're claiming, his federal tax, provincial. So it's kind of the entire eight-page federal tax return summarized in one place. And then at the very bottom of it, we're also going to give our clients some information, which is what is his marginal tax rate, what is his average tax rate, so approximately how much tax is he paying on every dollar that he has this year. And it will give him an estimate of his Manitoba Climate Action Incentive. If he's getting GST, it'll give him an estimate of that. If he's getting Canada Child Benefit, it'll give an estimate of that. So useful information for the client rather than giving them a full printed tax return. And therefore, useful information for you if you want to see most of the tax return with accurate numbers in one place, this is somewhere that you can go. That doesn't, however, solve the problem of what happened last year. So just above it, we have a document called the Comparative Summary. We use this all the time. This is the screen that I look at more than anything else. I'm going to see if I can make it bigger for you here. And what it does is it's going to show us the previous five years of data entry that I have in my computer. So if I want to see this year compared to the last five years, if that's how many years they've been our client at H&R Block, I can look at everything. And if you think of a tax return as someone's a snapshot of what happened in their life, 
you get really useful information. You can see as they go through, have they been in roughly the same job and their income has been going up? If I was doing Dave's return next year, I'd be looking at his 2020 and I go, oh, I noticed that you changed jobs in 2021. You had some time when you weren't employed and then it looks like you got a new job. So that would give me information of what had happened in the past. And I can also compare. So I can say, what did he get the year before? The year before he got not a very large refund and a portion of that came from climate action incentive. The year after that, he got a much larger refund and I can see why he got a larger refund as well. So this will be something that is true every time you do multiple returns. Super, super useful. It also helps us catch things that our clients haven't told us about. If I had a client who every single year has had interest income, and this year they didn't bring me a slip with interest income, I need to ask, what happened? Why did you have interest income every other year before now and not have any this year? And one of two things will happen. Most of the time they'll tell me, oh, well, I didn't get a slip from the bank this year. And I'll say, well, do you still have the same account? And they'll say, yes. And I'll say, did you have the same amount of money in the account? And I'll say, yes. And I'll say, okay, we need to look into that because it might be that you've missed a slip or maybe they're late sending it, or maybe it wasn't reported on a slip, but you had interest income that's enough to show up on a tax return. We really need to make sure we track that down. Or what happens in some cases is you'll say you had interest income every single year and then you didn't have it this year. They'll go, oh yeah, there was this big thing. We had this massive expense. We had to take all of our money out of our savings account. So we don't have any money in the savings account this year. And you're gonna go, okay, that's why you don't have interest income this year. But it does mean you have those clients who perpetually forget to bring you slips. And as you're going through, you're gonna go, oh, if you have dividend income and interest income every single year and you have a little bit of self-employment income, I need to know why you don't have it this year as a way of making sure you're not missing information that you might not have access to through rep a client or autofill my return. Uh, yeah, and, and Helene, autofill my return is wonderful, except sometimes the clients come in to file in early February or at a time when the slips haven't been posted yet. So our backup is looking at what happened last year. If they were a prior client, it's wonderful because I don't have to go into the CRA and look at every individual return. I can go into my computer here and see every line compared one to the other. So I can see employment income across the board rather than having to look at five different notices of assessment and comparing them against each other. So this is a really helpful tool. We're gonna to talk today about quality at source. How do we make sure we don't have mistakes? And one of the things that we're gonna do is compare and then consider. The, um, Helen, can we do autofill for new clients? We can. So we get authorization to represent them first. It's the first thing we do when they come into the office. As soon as we have authorization to represent them, we have access to autofill my return and represent a client. So we can do autofill for every return we do. Once it's turned on, the other thing to remember is that there will be periods of the year where we don't have access to it because the CRA is shut down because they are setting up for the new year. They're changing all of their um, all of their tax numbers. They're updating all their information. They're switching over from the previous tax year to this tax year. So there's always a period of time where we may not have access while the CRA is under maintenance. All right. So one thing that I want you to do as well, every time you have multi years in a practice problem and in real life, if you have multi years and for every new client, I want you to compare this year to last year. Think about what's different, why it's different and then use this as well to think about what's going to be different for next year. So if I go to my client, and this is Dave Duncan, and I'm gonna tell him this year you're getting a refund of $2,223, what will he expect for next year? When he comes in to file with us next year, what is he going to automatically assume will happen? He's gonna get the same refund. In real life, would Dave, knowing what you know about him, Assuming he has a normal life and nothing unusual happens next year, do you think he'll have the same refund next year? What will his life look like in a tax return? He'll have more income because he only worked for part of the year. So he'll have probably a little bit more income. He'll have the RPP deduction, that will help. But he won't have moving expenses. 
He may not have working from home expenses. We haven't had confirmation yet that they're going to do COVID working from home simplified flat rate for 2022. That could go away. If that goes away, no deduction there. So if we take out a couple of really big deductions for him, what will happen next year? Smaller refund. I like to make sure my clients know that. Even if they don't remember that, they, that we had that conversation, it's really good to say, just so you know, the reason you're getting a really big refund this year is because we claimed those moving expenses and that working from home. I want to remind you, you're not going to have those deductions for next year. So enjoy your refund. Congratulations. But for next year, if you're expecting the same type of refund, we need to talk about some tax planning so that you can do that. What is one option you might recommend to Dave if he wants to have a higher refund next year? And I'm going to remind you with his income that he's in the second tax bracket, moving up towards the third tax bracket. He might be a person for TFSAs. So, I mean, RSPs is what I meant to say, and what you put in the chat window, he might be a candidate for RSPs. So, if he wants to have a similar type of refund for next year, you can show him you might want to think about RSPs as an option where you're paying into your retirement, and you're going to get a, a little bit of a deduction from that. Or, if you think you're going to want to have a big refund, you can ask to have more taken off your tax return. You can file a TD1 for that. Or if, what I might recommend instead of doing that, because then the government is keeping your money for you, is just pay yourself your own refund. So whatever you were going to put on your TD1, instead of putting it on your TD1, put it into a TFSA. Don't touch it for the year. Leave it there. And at the end of the year, consider that your fund money, that you can do whatever you want. In the meantime, if it earns money while it's in that investment, it's going to be tax-free. So lots of things, but if he thinks he's going to get another $2,000 next year and he comes in and he has a normal year, he's not going to be very happy. So always think about this is what we did this year. Look at the year before. Make sure that both years make sense, and then think about next year. Okay, let's do our chapter review problems now from this chapter. So I want to go through the answers for those. You should have had an opportunity to work on them. I know one of them had a working from home, so if you didn't get the working from home data entry done, you'll be able to just pop that in because it's very fast data entry, and we can get the answer from that one as well. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. Let's do 200, and I'm going to start with the Brad Dolman file. Okay, so a quick reminder of who Brad Dolman was. I'm in the wrong chapter. I need chapter 17. We had Brad Dolman. He worked for a mining company. Then he was laid off. He applied for EI benefits. There was a COVID lockdown, so he received some COVID uh, wage loss benefits for a week. He wants to answer yes to Collections Canada question. We have T-slips. So we have a T4 for him. We have a T4E for him. We have a T4A with his COVID benefits. Hopefully you were able to find the T4A box 211. If not, I'm going to remind you where to get that one from. Remember there's that box where you can open up extra fields inside of T4A. It's the one that says other income 28 plus. You're going to find a lot of your COVID benefits in there as well. And let's see how we did. I'm going to find Brad Dolman now. So quick reminder, anytime you need extra information in a T4A, you're going to be looking in there. You can kind of look through here and see what else there is as well. There's research grants. Some we're going to talk about students. When we get to students, we'll show you that. We'll show you scholarships. And then we get into the 200 numbers. We have a lot of new boxes that were added in the last two years. We're going to have provincial COVID assistance. We're going to have repayments for federal. We're going to have Canada recovery benefits. Canada caregiving benefits, all of those are going to have right now a 200-something number on a T4A. So that's something that's pretty new for everyone working in tax. You're going to find it in the same place. So going into his return, if you answered everything correctly, you are going to have a balance owing. Does it make sense for him to have a balance owing?
Well, in this case, if I want a quick answer, I can go to the tax return summary, and I can say, well, let's see what he had. He had EI benefits plus some COVID benefits at a fairly high income rate and a social benefits repayment. There's his clawback. That's a big clawback. This might be the first time he had a clawback. We're going to make sure he knows that he had one and what that means for him and whether or not next time he ends up out of work for a little bit, he wants to really go on EI for that amount of money. So there's the clawback that I was expecting to see and now I can explain why he had such a big balance owing. Okay, what else do we need to look at for him? So I wanted you to make sure that you did have the other income, which was $300. Want to make sure you noticed that he had a pension plan and double check to make sure you have the box 52 in as well, which is the pension adjustment. Take a look at the, at the clawback, see how the clawback works. It comes out of income for social benefits repayment as a deduction, but then he has to actually pay it back so it becomes part of his tax bill for this year. And I want to double check that you did seven lines of entry in the T4, so let's take a look at that. In the T4, what did we have to enter? We had to enter 14, 16, 18, 20, 52, 22, and 44. He did have union dues. We're not going to enter boxes 24 and 26 because they were the maximum. Good. Any questions about this one that I can help you with? Not so far? Okay, if you think of one, let me know. We're going to go on to the next one. So the next one we have is Carl Gilmore. This one I did have a question for you, so I hope you thought about the answer to the question uh, because we're going to review that together as well. But let's take a look at the return first. So I'm going to pull up my case. What do we have for Carl? Carl hasn't filed for two years. We're going to do two years. I want to remind you again, if you are preparing multiple years, always start with the last year first. If you start with the most recent year, you're going to then, when you go back, have to reopen every file and update all of your carry forward information, recalculate everything. It gets really, really messy doing that. So if you have multiple years, start with the oldest one and do them in order. It causes big, big headaches if you do it the other way around. So we're going to do his 2020 first. He was working for Walmart as a sales clerk, and then he was laid off, and he was on EI for the rest of the year. Then in January, he got a new job and continued on from there. So for 2020, we're going to have two slips. This is the time where you're going to have to start paying attention to your data entry to the years that are on the tax slips. So it's good practice. We definitely have clients who come in and bring us T4s and, and tax slips and they put them all together in a pile and they don't double check the years. And if we have a lot of different slips, we start entering them and we enter all of them and we don't notice that maybe one of them was for an old tax year uh, that we should not be entering now. So as you're entering your slips in real life, make sure you're checking tax year as well. Definitely for this course, you're going to have to start looking for the years. So we have Walmart for 2020 and a T4E for 2020. Then we have a T4 for a Megabart in 2021. And we have a T4E in 2021. I'm going to take a look at both of his years now. I have to go look at the old year first. I'm going to change the tax year go into 2020, make sure that I'm in 2020 on the right side. I'm going to find my Carl Gilmore file. And if I've entered everything incorrectly, you're going to notice that he's going to have EI. So one of the problems with the 2020 year is depending on whether he is in Winnipeg or out of Winnipeg, you're going to get a different answer for the tax return. So I think I put that in your notes. If you were in Winnipeg, you're going to get the first number. If you were out of Winnipeg, you're going to get the second number. Okay, So in Winnipeg, he'll get a little bit less. Outside Winnipeg, he'll get a little bit more. And that's because the Climate Action Incentive was part of the tax return in 2020. 
this one is set up as the out of Winnipeg. So if you're outside Winnipeg, you should have gotten $412.09. Okay. Again, why is that his refund? Why does he have a refund? Let's take a look at his tax return. And if I go here, I can see that he did have some EI income, but not a lot. And he's pretty low income. He did have some deductions in addition to that. So he did have his registered pension plan. And when I go down to the bottom, he doesn't have to worry about a repayment or a clawback for EI. His income is too low for that. He also had a CPP overpayment. His employer took too much CPP off. That's very common to see when you're laid off in the first part of the year, or the earlier part of the year. They will take more CPP off at the beginning of the year and less at the end of the year. So when you have someone who works for part year, you expect to see more overpayments or underpayments. And then we're going to have climate action incentive on it as well. He will get GST. When will he get his GST? So for 2020, he should have gotten $456 paid out throughout 2021 and 2022. It's now 2022. When will he get that portion of GST? Will they still do four payments? Or will they give him a lump sum catch up payment? They'll give it to him all at once and they'll do it on the next date that they calculate GST. So depending on when he files his return and when it's processed, which is about two weeks after it's filed, they'll do the next date. So if he files it really close to October, like the last week of September, he'll be waiting till the next January payment. If he files it in September, he'll get it in October. It's whenever the next GST payment is, he'll get a lump sum. Good. Okay, so that one was fairly straightforward, I think. So make sure that you had all of the T4E boxes. I do want to show you very quickly that the data entry for T4Es in 2020 looks a little bit different. Remember I told you that there was this extra box in there for COVID? If this had been because of COVID payments, so if he had filed for CERB as the reason, he, and he filed for CERB after being laid off instead of filing under regular EI, what would have happened, and what I would have expected to see happen, is he would have had a T4 box 14, and he wouldn't have had a box 15. And as soon as that happens in the computer, you're going to get a warning message saying, we're missing information. And what I would have had to say is it would have looked like that instead. We would have had COVID benefits instead of regular benefits. And it's just one of those weird things. So we have an extra box. I'm going to take that out now because it's not what happened for him. It was regular EI for him. But if you do have to do a 2020 return, this is something you're going to see quite frequently. We have to go look at their CRA records to see if we can get information about the COVID benefits if they applied, but we also have to get information from Service Canada. So the client may have to go back to Service Canada and get a print printout or a statement of how much they received in CERB benefits, specifically CERB benefits through the EI program so that we know what number to put in that box to make everything work. Okay. So my T4 slip, if I've entered it correctly, I should have a box 14, 15, 22, and I need a box 7 filled in as well. That's 2020. Any questions about 2020 before I move on to his next tax year? Okay, I will go on to the next one. I'm going to change the tax year now to 2021. I'm going to notice it's already pre-selected me to be in his file, so I don't have to go looking for it again. When I go into here, I will have on the right side, if I want to, all of my 2020 data, so I can go and see what was the difference. So for 2020, what did we pick? Well, he used to work for Walmart. Now he works for Omega Mart. Last year, he had more EI income than he did for this year. I can see all of that information. If he had moved, if anything had changed, it would be showing up here as well. So I can see everything on this screen. T4 
to compare last year's data entry to this year's data entry. If I go to the tax return, I want to do a comparative summary. I want to see what the difference was in one place. So in my comparative summary, I'm going to have a difference of income. His income was higher. His EI benefits were lower. He had more rich pension plan because he worked for longer in the year, and it's a different employer. Basic amounts are going to change. Those things we don't worry about that much because they are pretty typical. CPP and EI has changed. It's gone up because inflation and because he worked more. The employment amount has gone up. You can see down at the bottom here, there was no CPP overpayment this year. There was no climate action incentive this year on the tax return. The climate action incentive last year was in, or in 2020 was included in the return, but now it's being paid out like the GST and four payments. And there's a big, big difference in his refund. So what I would like to know is why is his refund so different? I think that was the question that I asked. Because he's going to want to know. He's going to go, well, last year I got a whole bunch more money, and this year I didn't. So I want you to take a look and think about it for a minute and say, what was the thing that contributed the most to his refund last year? Why did he get a big refund last year? And we're going to do a little poll question here. Okay. So what I'm asking for is, what was the biggest contributing factor to his refund? They might all have been a contributing factor, but what is the biggest one? So option A, he got a smaller refund because he had more income from uh, he had more income from EI employment insurance in that year. Did he get a bigger refund because he had a smaller registered pension plan con contribution? Did he get a bigger refund because he had smaller non-refundable credits, or did he get a bigger refund because the climate action incentive was on 2020? What do we think? What was the biggest contributing factor to the refund in 2020? Okay, lock your answer in. Hit the submit button if you think you have an answer. How do we do? We got a little mix here. Let's see. So I'd say the majority of people who answered said it's because of the climate action incentive. Let's talk that through. Is having more employment insurance going to increase your refund or decrease your refund? Generally, it'll decrease your refund. I would expect if you have less EI to have a bigger refund the next year. So that's not the right answer. Registered pension plan, same thing. More registered pension plan, bigger deduction. If he had more deductions next year, he should have had a bigger refund, not a smaller one. CPP and EI, I want you to remember, will never ever factor into your refund because your employer knows what they are. They've already factored in. in. So they're going to go up and down every year based on your income. The goal of your employer is to have you owe zero tax and have zero refund. So CPP and EI will never explain why someone has a large refund or a small refund unless it's an overpayment. If it's an overpayment, it may be relevant, but he doesn't have an overpayment. And then climate action incentive. And if I look here at his refund, his refund is $412, but 396 of that is from a refundable climate action incentive credit. So if I took that off, if I had 412 minus 396, you're going to notice his refund is pretty much the same. There's very little difference between the two. Can you reassure this client that you didn't do a worse job for him this year than you did last year? What are you going to tell the client that will make him feel better about the fact that last year he got $412 and this year he's getting $18. You're going to tell him he's still getting climate action incentive. We have applied for it. By filing the return, you're going to get it. You're just not going to get it on the refund today. They're moving it into four payments. So he's actually in the same position this year as last year. It just looks a little bit different. This is something we have to explain to our clients all the time. 
anytime we're doing a 2020 return in Manitoba followed by a 2021 return, you're going to get this question. So I wanted to make sure you thought about it a little bit. So he's still getting the same amount, he's getting climate action, and he's getting his tax refund. The difference is this time, the climate action incentive is going to be handled off of the return in separate checks. Good. All right, something to think about. Let's jump into the next one then. Now we have Woody Waterbucket. Woody works as a mechanic at a new and used car dealership. He also puts in 250 hours as a volunteer firefighter and he received an honorarium for 950. Uh, oh, your DT Max indicated that you had, okay. So he, if you have DT Max that's giving you a climate action incentive on the return in 2021, it means you don't have the current version of the software. If you were a prior student and you've taken a course before, you have to completely uninstall DT Max and before you install a new one. So you're going to have to save all of your exercises by extracting them, save them somewhere, and then completely uninstall DT Max and reinstall it. What it means is you're still using the 2020, 2020 numbers. It just says 2021 on it because it hasn't been updated. Okay. If you go back to the instructions, it gives you information for how to uninstall. Yep. Okay. So we're going to do Woody Water Bucket. Woody is a mechanic at a new and used car dealership. He was also a volunteer firefighter and he had an honorarium in the amount of $950. Is he eligible for the volunteer firefighter amount if he did 250 hours? Yes. So whatever we do in the computer, we want to make sure he has the option of getting it if it is better for him. Okay. He also inherited a piece of land in California. The land was appraised at Canadian 180000 do we need to know that? Is that relevant information? Yes, it is. Remember, land does not count as personal use property because you can't use it for personal things until you have buildings on it. So if it's land and there's nothing on it, it's going to be on a T1135. Good. He is not a Canadian citizen. That's going to be important for the tax return. Don't tell them. Okay, so the land was appraised at Canadian 180,000. So that's over 100,000. So we have to worry about that. But if it was less than 100,000, we don't have to report it. That's true. Okay, but in this case, it was more, so we need to know. All right, and then we have a T4 for him and we have a T4 from the fire department with the honorarium here. And I want to remind you that box 14 is blank but you can't have a box 14 in your computer that's blank. So you will have had to have entered zero in your data entry for that one. Let's take a look at Woody. I have to select elections in order to tell the computer he's not a Canadian citizen. Remember the default is that you are a Canadian citizen and you want to sign up. If that's correct, do no data entry. In this case, I need to use my keyword elections. I need to have done a T1135. I'm going to do simplified for this one because it's less than 250,000 Canadian. So I'm going to do simplified and it's land, so it's real property and I need my income or gain or loss or you're going to have warnings. And to clear your warning, I know everyone finds this one confusing. This is the type of warning where the computer is reminding you to do something. So if I did not have a check mark in that box, I'm going to have the computer tell me multiple times it's going to tell me every time I generate the tax return. It's going to tell me every time I look at notes and diagnostics in a couple of places. Don't forget, you need to submit this. So until I submit it, I'm going to keep getting that warning. To make the warning go away, you need to tell the computer that you know that you need to do it. So you're going to put a check mark on the top line of the foreign info. So I'm going to highlight my foreign info line. I'm going to press the equal sign. I'm going to get a green check mark and my warning will clear. We're going to talk more today about clearing warnings being very important. So I want to make sure you all know how to clear that one. All right, now we have a T4, standard T4, not a problem. You should be very comfortable entering those. I want you to notice he did have union dues. We're going to make sure those union dues are showing up. And then for the Winnipeg Fire Department, you do need a box 14 answer. And it was blank, so we need to put zero in there. I'm going to say volunteer firefighter exempt amount. 
I want you to notice I have not done any data entry on the volunteer line. I don't have to. As soon as I tell the computer that he had exempt income, the computer will assume that he did 200 or more hours, and it will calculate the best thing for me. If he had not had this, and he was just a volunteer firefighter with no honorarium, I would have to tell the computer to give it to him. But because he has exempt income, the computer will assume he did 200 hours. In this case, that's fine. He did do 200 hours, so I can leave the data entry as it is. All right, and if I do all of those things and I go to the tax return, and I take a look at my summary page here, I'm going to have total income, union dues, CPP, you're going to notice that the exempt income has been added in. They put it in for you because we're also going to claim the volunteer firefighter amount. In this case, it is better for him to have $3,000 credit than to have a deduction of the exempt income. So for that reason, the credit is going to be better. We're going to give it to him. I haven't had to do anything to make that happen. The computer knew to add it in for me. And then down at the bottom, hopefully we all have a refund. If we have a refund of 638.06, then you did that one correctly. Is there anything else that I wanted you to see for that one? Not a Canadian citizen. I want to make sure he's not a Canadian citizen. I'm going to triple check that I did that. And I'm going to triple check that I have the correct T1135. So it says yes. I have generated a T1135. I've done individual code 2 because he is not self-employed. It's going to fill in his name. I have picked simplified to make my life easy. I have picked real property. Remember, you have to have at least one of these boxes selected, or he's going to get a slightly irritated letter from the CRA going, what are you doing? And we need at least one country. He only had one in this case. It was land in the USA. And I need to have zeros here. Remember, as you're doing it, that there will be no decimal places. Even if you report decimal places in your data entry, it's going to drop it down to whole numbers for the T1135. If income has to show up on the tax return, we always have to calculate it to two decimal places. Okay? And don't forget to convert to Canadian if the problem didn't convert it for you. In this case, they've already converted it for you. Okay. What else? Yes, what I would like to know is what would his GST have been if he had only volunteered 150 hours, and what would the refund have been? So if you were curious about this and you wanted to know what it would look like, you can double check your data entry. Sometimes your clients are going to ask you to show them an estimate of something. We'll talk more about that in our last class. We're going to talk about something called plans. But if we're changing just one number, we can show it relatively quickly. How do we do that? Well, if you say volunteer, I have to now tell the computer that he didn't do 250, 200 hours. If I make him not eligible, the computer will do all of the adjustments for me. So now you're going to notice that my employment income is less. And if I jump down to the bottom, you're going to notice my refund is significantly less than it was. So that would have reduced his refund quite a bit. So for example, he might say, well, I'm doing all this vol volunteer firefighting. How much is it helping me on my tax return? Because I have this income as well. What difference would it be if I worked fewer hours next year? And you can say, well, assuming everything else was the same, it's going to look something like this. So his refund or balance one would come down. And I thought the GST one was interesting only because that little bit of exempt income was just enough to give him a GST credit. So that extra income added to his return took away his GST credit of $46.16, but it cost him a significant amount of refund money on the tax return. So this is one of those cases where he's right on the border of income where he's going to get GST and he's not going to get GST. And that small amount of exempt income is making the difference for him. So I thought that was an interesting thing to look at to see how many things can be affected by one small change on a tax return. Okay. So if the client was curious about it, he says, oh, geez, you know, I used to get a GST credit, and now I'm not getting a GST credit anymore, and all, all this volunteer stuff is, is taking my GST credit away. What benefit is that to me? I can show him. You did lose GST credit. You would have had $46.16. 
but your income from your employment is getting to the point where you weren't going to get that anyway. So next year I wasn't expecting you to get that anyway. Now let's take a look at what's happening. That volunteer credit that you're getting is giving you about almost $500, about around $500 extra refund. So if you want that extra $500 refund, then keep doing the volunteer work because yes, we're adding a little bit of income to your return, but that credit is much, much more valuable to you. And then you'll go and go, okay, I think I'll keep volunteering then. So I'm gonna take it back out again. I'm gonna go back to my tax return and I'm gonna give him the nice $638 refund that he wants. All right, any questions about this one? We've got one more to do and then we will take a break. So let's do Gloria. Gloria, again, we're doing two years for Gloria. And I've asked you some questions. So as I'm going through these two years, I want you to be thinking about why is her refund larger and what will next year look like? So the questions we should ask after every file, whether we did their return last year or not, always ask what's different from last year, what's going to change for next year. Let's take a look at her case in the practice problem. So Gloria is not Oh, Gloria is a Canadian citizen. She wants to answer yes to the Elections Canada question. In 2020, she had a T4 from Mammoth Corporation and she was working from home. After calculating that, it was 187 days. And they've determined that flat rate is better, so we're gonna do flat rate for her. Again, if you didn't have time to put that one thing in, you'll be able to do it now because we showed you how to do it. You're gonna choose T777S in the 2020 file you choose flat rate simplified method. And then you can just put in qualified. Yes, she's qualified for it. 187 days is more than four continuous weeks. And then you're just gonna put in the number. Okay. And then 2021, she exercised the stock option. So she had some income added to her box 14. She had 6,600 added to her box 14. That was the benefit of the stock option. That's the discount that she got on her shares. But because that should only be taxed to 50%, she's gonna get a stock option deduction as well in box 39. And then we have her T4 for the rest of the year and that's it for, for her. So let's take a look at her returns. And what I'm gonna do for this one, rather than show you the data entry by switching years, I'm gonna show you the data entry using my right side, left side comparison. So what was the same? Her personal data was the same. Her T4 was different. You're gonna notice that her T4 from 2020 had some extra boxes. We don't make it mandatory to enter these. I have entered them because I think it's useful to have a record. And in real life, if you're doing autofill my return, it's gonna automatically get transferred over anyway. But I do think it's useful to have as a record when you're going back in case that client gets audited related to their COVID benefits. So that's a big difference. This year she had her security options deduction, last year she didn't. Last year she had temporary flat rate 187 days. This year she worked so much she didn't take any vacation. She worked 100% of the year with no time off except for stat holidays. She's gonna get 250 days. I wanna really stress in real life, there are very, very few clients who have worked 250 days from home. So they will all say the maximum and you will calculate it out. And we have, we have seen in pretty much every case that I've done that they have not worked every single possible working day from home. But if they did, she'll get the 250, so we're gonna put it in for her. So a little bit less working from home in 2020, more working from home in 2021. I can now go to the tax return and I'm gonna do my comparative summary and we're gonna see what we get. Comparative summary, you have to be careful if you're double checking your work, it is not the most accurate summary to look at because it's going to round your numbers up. So make it all fit on one page, you're not gonna see decimal places. So the refund is 1475 roughly, but her actual refund is 1475.16. So those little details you have to go to the tax return to see, or you can go to the tax return summary if you want full numbers. 
But for a quick view between the comparative summary, I want you to notice her employment income went up. Her registered pension plan deduction went up as her income did. We normally see that. Her employment expenses went up. She had fewer days in 2020 and more days in 2021. There's her security options deduction. Everything else went up with inflation, which we expect to see. But remember, EI and CPP are always adjusted for by your employer, so they should not have an effect on your refund at the end unless there was a significant overpayment. And then down at the bottom, climate action incentive last year is not going to show up this year, which is fine. So we have that there as well. What I'm going to ask you next is, what was the biggest contributing factor to her refund being larger in 2021 than in the year before? So there are several things that are going to make her refund bigger. What was the biggest contributing factor? All right, we're going to do a quick poll for that one. So did she have a larger refund because she had more employment income? Did she have a larger refund because she had more registered pension plan deduction? Did she have a larger refund because of the security options deduction in 2021? Did she have a larger refund because she had more non-refundable credits for CPP and EI? Or is it because of the climate action incentive? Okay, let me know what you think. I've had three people participate. I would like to see a few more people. You've got 15 seconds to lock in an answer. Hit the submit button when you have your choice. Okay, how did we do? Pretty good on this one. I'm actually impressed. So if you said it was because of the registered pension plan contribution, you're not wrong. That did increase, and we would expect it to increase the refund. However, her income also increased, so she needed a bigger deduction, and it didn't increase by a lot. So you're not wrong that it created a benefit to her. It is good that she had it, but that's not the main reason why there's such a big difference between these two numbers. Okay. More employment income is usually bad on a tax return. It's good in real life and not good on a tax return. So no one picked that one. Remember again, CPP and EI should never affect your refund unless it's an overpayment. So in this case, the fact that her non-refundable credits went up because of inflation should not have had any effect on her having a larger refund. The employer should have adjusted appropriately. So in this case, that would not explain it. If you said security options deduction, that is correct. So the reason her return is so different from the previous year to this year is that one. And then it's not climate action incentive because that actually did the opposite. Climate action incentive improved her refund last year and she got less this year. So that was not the correct answer. But security options was. So if that's true, what will next year be like for her? She's walking out today with over $1,000 in refund. What do we need to advise her for next year? Yeah, unless she does the same thing and exercises a second security options deduction, and she has no control over that because her employer may not offer one. Unless she does the same thing again, she's not going to get that large of a refund. She's going to get a much smaller refund. So you can let her know that that is something to expect. Now, her income would be lower because, remember, her income was boosted by the benefit of the security option, but the deduction only covered half of it, and so it is beneficial to her in this year to have that deduction. Next year, probably not going to get a very big refund unless she does something. What can she do? RSPs are an option for her. She's in the second tax bracket. She's getting closer and closer to the third tax bracket. As she goes up in tax brackets, those RSPs become more beneficial. Or other options. She could donate. She could contribute to political party. Lots of things that she could do to improve her refund for next year. But if she doesn't do anything, you need to warn her that she's not going to be seeing a refund like that. In fact, she may not 
see much of a refund at all. Also, I want you to warn her, employment expenses may not happen next year. We don't know yet, but as far as we know, it was 2020 and 2021 only that we're doing COVID working from home flat rate benefits. If they take those away, that's also going to reduce her refund again. Okay. Good. Let's take a break there. Oh, wait, can she volunteer for police to get a credit? She could volunteer for search and rescue, but she'd have to do at least 200 hours. And I don't know if she has the time or inclination or skills for that. But if it's something she's interested in or she's already doing, but she's doing on a small scale, she can increase that. The big ones are going to be RSPs or putting more money aside for yourself, paying yourself your own refund, or donations. Donations and political contributions are also options. Okay, let's take a break there. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to say six minute break. We're going to come back at 10:12, and then we're going to jump into the next chapter. Welcome back from our break. We are going to start chapter 18 now. So give me a green check mark. Let me know if you're back. This is not the most interesting chapter. I think it's one of the most important TPS chapters. And I am going to warn you, if you are here, we do mark you significantly on this chapter as well. So what I'm teaching you today, there will be additional marks awarded for doing your quality at source correctly. It is possible to do the return 100% right and not do any of the quality at source that we've asked you to do for all files, and you will not pass the TPS exam if you do that. So that's how serious we take this. It is very important that as we do returns, we are doing them accurately. So we're going to teach you today the tools that we use to ensure we have an accurate return, and I'm going to stress what you are going to be required to do on your own. For the purposes of the exam, when we get to the TPS exam, you will have instructions reminding you what the quality of source rules are, and I guarantee there will be questions worth marks on the exam related to this chapter because we care very deeply about it. We're very, very passionate about making sure everyone is doing accurate returns. So there's your incentive to pay attention to this maybe not the most interesting chapter in the whole world, but a very, very useful one. So I'm going to share my screen now. And as we go through things, I'm going to demonstrate a little bit on the cases we already have. You're going to notice we don't have an in-class exercise for this chapter. So your practice problems are going to be practicing things you already know how to do data entry for. And more importantly, it's going to be practicing quality of source. So as we go through, I'm going to be talking in more detail about what we want to be doing for that. So we're going to start with the idea of warning messages. This I've already taught you. Because it's so important, I teach this before we officially have to learn it. But I just want to remind you how critical it is to review your warning messages. Always clear your warnings so that you have no warnings before you attempt to file a return. Um, can I enlarge my screen? This portion of it I can't, unfortunately. But I will give it a try. Um, when I open it up here. If that's still not working, um, I don't know if I'm going to help you, but what you can do is follow along on your DT Max. So I'm going to open any file at random. I'm going to pick the Gloria McMahon because that's the one we were in, just to remind you what warnings look like. So I'm going to take a few things out, and then I'm going to have to put them back in. I take this one out. If I change this number, that's a good number to change. And if I think that should do it, if I enter a T-slip, something blank in it, that one's not going to work. Let's see if I do a T4, put something in here. Okay, so I've created a whole bunch of warnings for myself. What you're going to do every time you do a return, every time you enter something, is you're going to be looking for this little warning yield sign at the top. If you have been skipping this because you think it's not important, 
now you have to stop skipping it. One question we'll be asking you is how many warnings do you have? And the answer should generally be none. So if I click on this warning, it's going to do one of two things. I'm going to have a red warning, which is a circle with an X in it. That means I can't generate a return. If you had done a TPS exam and you can't generate a return, then there is nothing to mark. So a red X is going to mean you get zero on your exam because we don't have an exam to look at. So you're going to have to clear your red warnings for sure. If I try to generate a return now, so if I say Alt F9, please recalculate this return for me, it's going to give me my warnings again. It's going to put it in a little box on my screen. And then it's just going to say calculations failed. There is no return. So you will know that you have done this by looking at the return because there is no return for you to look at. I have to go to my data entry and I have to fix the warnings. In order to fix the warnings, your best advice is read what they are saying. So the warning will be telling you something. If you have that, it's going to say error, error, error. The first element in a group cannot be blank. I have to fix that warning. I have to go find where I have an element in a group that is blank. Generally speaking, if you double click on the warning that you're trying to deal with, it will take you roughly to the part of the tax return you should be looking at. It's going to tell me, oh, you have a T4, but you don't have anything in it. Maybe when I was doing my data entry, I opened a box. I thought I was typing inside the T4 I had here, but I added something elsewhere. I'm going to have to go in and delete it. If I delete it, hopefully my warning will go away. And it did. So if you read your warnings carefully, they're going to tell you what they're doing. There are three types of warnings generally that you will get that are for yield signs, and then you're going to have the red X, I won't generate a return unless you fill this number in because I really, really care about it. So the red X means we can't generate a return without that information. The warnings are going to be either you're missing something that I think you need, or you have a calculation that doesn't make sense to me, or please remember to file that thing. So those are the three options for warnings you're going to get. You're going to get I think you need this data, please put it in. Those are the ones where you usually will see a blue star. So you're already being warned when you open your data entry what you should be ad adding. But sometimes they don't have a blue star for them, but the computer's still going to say, I really do think you should have a street for your street address. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to do her street. And in this case, if I don't remember what it was because I accidentally deleted something, I can put it in here. So what I can do, if I have data on the right side and I want to move it to the left side, this is something that you haven't learned how to do, but we do this when we do autofill my return, and I'll show you this again in the future. Anything on the right side can be transferred to the left side. If I select what I'm looking for, I should have the option of copying it to the left-hand side. So you're going to see I can take whatever's on the right, and I can move it over to the left. The one box that it doesn't work for is this one, unfortunately. But in real life, when we're doing autofill my return, that's what I would do. So generally speaking, you would have the option of selecting a multiple lines and then copying them over. Let's see if I can do the whole, the whole set. I think I can. If I delete the marked keywords, now I don't have an address. If I select everything that I want to select in here, I'm going to make it dark. I should be able to clear marks, should be able to go from here all the way down to here, select what I want to do, should be able to copy it over to the left-hand side. Again, the address is the one that that doesn't like to do it for, but if you do, it should pop it all back in for you. I'm going to show you that one more time because it's really nice to see. So if I delete something by accident and I know that it's carried forward from the previous year, I'm going to delete everything. It's going to be in here if I clear my marks. Now I have a warning saying, oh, we can't do your return. You're missing the address. Address is incomplete. Got two warnings for that telling me put an address in. If I don't want to type it, and I did last year's return, and it's the same as last year, I don't have to type it again. I'm going to select the bottom one that I want, hold shift down, select the top one that I want. It's going to highlight everything that has data in it. And then what I'm going to do is right click inside the highlighted area, and I'm going to choose copy to left hand side and it'll pop it all over for me. So again, when we do autofill my return, that's how we do it. The next thing you do every time you do autofill my return is you're going to double check your slips. We'll talk about that as well.
Okay. So now that I have fixed the street and the postal code and I have a complete address, you're going to notice those warnings have gone away. The second warning you will get is one saying, I'm not sure about that number. It doesn't make sense to me. Please double check it. So now I have a warning that says the CPP contribution is inconsistent. They're expecting me to have entered 3,166.54. I entered 3,186, or sorry, 366.45. I entered 3,186.45. If I double click on that one, again, it's going to take me right to the line it's asking me about. And I'm going to look at that and say, oh, did I do that right? If I did it wrong, I should correct it. If I did it right, it means that there may be an overpayment or an underpayment, but if you double check that the slip is correct and you want the warning to go away, you have to put a check mark on it, tell the computer, yes, that's actually what I meant. I did mean for it to be 3,186. That's what the employer submitted. They shouldn't have. We'll probably see an overpayment when I do that, but that's what that warning means. So not everything means you made a mistake. It just means, please check this number, it's important. So in this case, I did make a mistake, so I will correct it. If it is correct, once I've corrected it, it should clear the warning as well. And then remember the last one that you're going to get is something reminding you that you have to complete a form that needs to be submitted. So if for this particular person, I had a T1135, and I'm saying do simplified, and I want to complete the statement, and I'm gonna put everything in, I have to have at least one property type. I have to have at least one country code. I'm going to have blue warnings if I don't do otherwise. It's going to ask me, please do your gain and loss. I'm going to say, okay, they're both zero. And then I'm going to still have a warning there. And the warning that I'm going to have there is going to say, you need to file this. And I haven't filed it because I can't file it because our computer won't let us file it. But in a real office setting, when I file it, the warning will go away. Also in a real office setting, if you have done something and you needed to mark that, yes, I know I need to file this, I have thought about it, you can make that warning go away with a green check mark so you're not dealing with it all the time. Anytime you have a warning that you haven't cleared, that box will be yellow. When everything is clear, that box will be gray. We will require you from this point on to the end of the course to always have a gray yield box with no warnings in it. I'm going to show you again what happens with warnings. So I'm going to take this one out because I don't want this one, but I'm going to put a few of the not critical ones back in. So for this one, I think what I will do is going back to the T4, I'm going to change this one, but I won't clear the warning. And I'm going to go into the street and I'm going to take the street out. So I can generate a return, but I have warnings that I haven't cleared. When I go to the tax return now, it's going to give me my warnings. It's going to say calculating, but it's going to give me my warnings first and go, are you really sure you want to calculate that without answering my questions? I'm going to say, yeah, I'm busy. I'm not reading my warnings today. The next thing you're going to go to is your notes and diagnostics. On your notes and diagnostics, you will have a list of warnings at the top of your screen. So we will be asking you on anything we mark at this point, how many warnings do you have for your data editor warnings? The answer should be zero, okay? There are a few warnings that you might see all the time that are okay, but if you have anything here under data editor warnings, that is a problem and you will lose marks if you have not corrected those things. So I'm gonna take them out so that they are fixed, but this is the next source that you have to tell you there is something that I really do need to do. So the computer is gonna try very, very hard to make you be careful. And if you are not being careful, um, it's going to keep reminding you, and you're going to have to keep ignoring it. Try not to do that. Let me see if I have cleared this, and I'm going to fix this. Oh, that's still the wrong number. That's the one I want it to be. Go to the tax return. You're going to notice my data entry warnings are gone. Warnings that are, are okay on the notes and diagnostics, you might have, if you've done multiple years, a warning about CRA authorizing or canceling a representative. So they're going to say this was previously generated and just a reminder, if it wasn't actually previously generated, you need to do something, okay? That one I may be able to make go away. I'm gonna see if I can using authorize, just to see, because they change this every year. No, nope, it's already selected. 
So what happens when you have a new client is you're going to generate um, you're going to generate a CRA authorization form. If you have an old client and you need to generate a new one because they've canceled your authorization, you're going to go to the keyword authorize. So if I go to the keyword authorize and I now need to do a new authorization form, I can choose give me a CRA authorization form. If they're a prior client, it will always say it was already authorized. But if they're a new client and you need to create one, you create one this way. Or if they're an old client who's canceled your authorization and now you need a new form for them, you can go into authorize and change that. Okay. It's going to give me a warning because it's telling me I have to file it. So it's going, if you want to create it, that's fine, but don't forget after they sign it, you have to file it. So I'm going to continue calculating with my warning. I'm going to have the, can the authorization page. It's going to look like this. We do this for every new client that we have. We get them to authorize us so we can access them through represent a client. They sign it. Then we're going to file it. We file it, which you can't do, but we're going to do in an office setting. We go into e-file and we say CRA authorizing. And then after we've authorized it, again, I'm going to come here and I'm going to clear my warning to make the warning go away. But if I have done that and I go back up to my notes and diagnostics, I'm still going to get that warning saying, make sure you filed it. So that warning, any warning related to CRI authorizing or canceling representative should be okay. And then in an office, once you have filed it, some of those warnings will go away. Okay. I'm going to put this one back to what it should be, which is we already have one for them. So you may see a CRA authorizing or canceling representative warning. And then for this course, you will see ineligible for federal e-file. Okay. Ineligible for federal e-file, if it says e-file setup is incomplete, then you're fine. If it says anything else, then it means it will not file. So anything other than e-file setup is incomplete, you are going to lose marks for. Because in a real office setting, that return would not be able to be filed. And we need the return to be able to be filed. So when you're doing your notes and diagnostics pages now, I want you to make sure you have no data entry, data entry warnings or data editor warnings, and make sure the only thing for in, ineligible for federal e-file is one bullet point that says the e-file setup is incomplete. Are there any questions about that notes and diagnostics page, or about warnings that you have that you're not sure how to clear? Uh, so, Helene, your tax return won't generate with any warning, whether it's yellow warnings or otherwise. You might need to kind of force it to generate, which would be Alt F9 to recalculate. So sometimes they just get hung up when they're trying to calculate. Um, if it's still having that issue, um, what I'm going to ask you to do is send me a screenshot of what your warnings look like. So click on the yellow so I can see what type of warnings you have and then send me a screenshot of what it looks like when you try. So if it says calculations failed, or if it just says calculating and it hangs on it, let me know. I might be able to troubleshoot from there. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on on your computer, on your side of things, but if you send me some pictures of your screen, a lot of times I can figure it out. Okay, there's a few other things near notes and diagnostics that I want you to notice. You may have an optimization report. This is going to be more relevant when we start dealing with families. So I'm going to have you revisit this as we go later on in the course. But an optimization report will give you some information along the lines of if you have options, like you have two people and you can choose who's going to get medical expenses, the computer is going to recommend one person and tell you why. So optimization report will have a few useful things in there. And then there will be an error prevention report as well. This is going to be a section where it's going to give you some more information that might be useful when you're doing the return. So this is going to say, oh, there is a security options benefit. Here's a few things to double check in your data entry. Make sure you've done these things. So then it's going to say, oh, if you've sold shares, don't forget you need to dispose of the shares and that's how you do it. Don't forget to include the box 38. So make sure you have a box 38, and if you're not sure, you can double-click 
and it'll pull up the source keywords and then you can add them into your computer. So if you double click on words that are keywords, then you say add to data or find in data, it's going to take you to that part of your data entry. So useful tips and tricks on the error prevention report. Email address, it's going to say you've entered one, but you haven't signed her up for online mail. Did you want to do that? If you did, it's going to tell you what keyword you need. If you didn't want to do it, you don't need to do anything. And one that I absolutely love, because I have clients come in and tell me I had some medical expenses, but I don't know if I had enough to use, the error prevention report will tell you how many medical expenses Gloria McMahon would have to have in order to be able to claim any. Because remember, they have to be reduced by 3% of her net income, or 2421. Based on her income, she would need more than $2,312.69 of medical expenses because that's how much we have to reduce her medical expenses by. So if you have a client who says, I had a lot of medical expenses, can I claim them this year? You're going to go here, you're going to go, well, did you have $2,312? And she's going to go, no, I have like 500. The next thing you're going to ask her is, did you pay for medical insurance premiums on top of that? Because that might be enough to bump her over. But generally speaking, it gives the client a picture of how much am I going to need before I'm going to benefit from these. You have to be careful if it's a low income client. This may remind you that they can't benefit from claiming those because they're not going to get a credit based on their income or they don't need it but don't forget they may have a refundable medical expense supplement. So keep an, keep a, an eye and for the back, back of your mind, keep an option open, low-income clients with medical expenses, even if the computer isn't prompting you to enter them, there may be a reason to put them in. We'll talk about that more in the chapter on families when we do medical expenses as well. Okay, so this error prevention report, I use this all the time. Notes and diagnostics, again, first place is, is it gonna e-file, have I made a big mistake? Then you go optimization report. If you think there's something that can be split between people, what options do we have? And then error prevention report is going to give me some additional information, which will help me make good decisions for the tax return. Right. So that's the first place that we're going to find information that's going to help us in terms of making sure we have the right information for our clients and that we haven't made errors that we haven't addressed. The next thing I want to show you is how to do notes because sometimes we have things we need to explain or we have things we need to keep track of. And we don't always want to have to go and pull a paper file for a client, especially if it's going to be an old paper file. So there are three different ways of doing notes in the DT Max that you can access later and I'm going to show you each of them. And I'm also going to tell you when I do them and why I do them. So the first one I want to show you is how do you attach a note to explain a single line of data entry? If I need to explain, explain a single line of data entry, I want an explanation or a note for it there. So I'm going to go into my Dave Duncan file because that has some good things that I might want to do here because I did moving expenses for that. Okay, so if I'm going in here and I've done a calculation and it's going to be a different calculation. So maybe he had three days of travel, but he only ate eight meals. In that case, when I'm going back in it, I don't want to come back the next year and say, oh, but I could have claimed nine. Why didn't I claim nine? If I want a little note here, what I can do is pick the line that I want to put a note on. I'm going to select it with my mouse. I'm going to right click on it. And this time I'm going to choose control plus N, or I'm going to choose attach note to keyword. It's going to open a little box and I can say client only ate eight meals while traveling, whatever I want the note to be. Then I'm going to hit save, and I want you to notice you're going to get a little tiny paper clip with a little post-it note picture. So that's going to put a note on that line. When I go to the tax return, I'm not going to see anything related to that note. It's not going to show up anywhere. If I go to notes and diagnostics, there won't be anything telling me there's a note in the file. But when I'm coming back to that file again later, and I had a calculation that I had to do, maybe for a day's work from home, the client says I worked from home all year, and then you calculated based on the vacation days that she gave you at a different number, that's a really good place to put a note. I would then go in here and I would say, okay, I want to attach a note. Maybe my client said that they worked, um, you know, five days a week, 
uh, Monday to Friday, and then it would be five days per week, Monday to Friday. Uh, vacation was July 17 to July 28, and December 20 to 31st. And then I'm going to say how I did my calculation. I'm going to put whatever detail I want to be able to find again, and I'm going to hit save. And again, I'm going to have a little paper clip on there. And then if you want to go back and see it, next year when I go back to this file, if I go look at my 2021 file and I open it up and I want to see where I got that number from, I can right click on the note again and say attach note again. It's going to open up the old note. Now I can edit that note if I need to edit it. I can save it. If I want to delete it, because now it's wrong and I'm not supposed to have that information, I'm just going to delete the text or hit the clear button, and then you have to hit save. And when you hit save, it should go away. So delete this keyword. Oh, not delete the keyword. That's not what I wanted to do. I want to delete the note. So again, I'm going to take the note off this one. I'm going to attach the note. I'm going to clear it, and I'm going to hit save, and the note will go away. So that's going to connect it to a single line. If you're doing a calculation, it's good to explain where you got your numbers from. If your client gave you a piece of information that is relevant to a single line of data entry, you're going to put that in. Anything you need to remember attached to one thing. Okay. One more reminder to put a note in. Right click, attach note, type your note here, hit save, the paper clip comes back. I go out and I go into a different client, then I go back to Dave, there's my paper clip waiting for me. To reopen the paper clip, you say attach note again. To delete, you're going to hit clear and hit save, and it will go away. Okay? That's the first type of note we do. Uh, is there a way to look at all the notes for file in one place? There is not. So what you're going to do is those are notes where you say, where did I get that number from? Go look at your data entry and see if you put a note on it, and hopefully you did. I recommend everyone who learns to do tax returns, please use your notes. You might be the person who did the file, and I, three years later, in working in the summer, might be the person helping that client with an audit. And if you had a calculation that you put down and you didn't put a note on it, then the clients, I'm going to go to the client and go, okay, you said that you worked from home for 180 days. Um, can you tell me where you got that number from? And the client's going to go, no. Like, well, when did you work? I don't remember. That was three years ago. Well, did you take vacation? Oh, I, I don't think I can find that now. And I have to explain to the CRA why I picked 180 days. It would be really nice if when I do that, I can go open the paper clip that you made and see, oh, this, we, these were the dates that we had. Let's send a letter to the employer, get them to sign it, say that this looks right. The employer probably won't even check, and off we send it to the CRA, and we can get that audit done. So if you put notes when you do calculations and someone else has to go in and see what happened, we can recreate what you did, as opposed to, well, there's a number there, and I don't know why we have that number. Okay? So that's what we use that type of note for. Now, there might be a note that we need to do to remind us of something for next year. So that's the next type of note that I am going to show you. And those ones we can find all in one place. We're going to find them on the Notes Diagnostics page. So if we need a note that we want to exist not just for this tax year, but this year and all of the tax years connected to this file, we want this note on the file. It's an important note to keep. That's where we're going to go into our section under Accountant. So if you're in your section, this is going to be a part that's automatically in there. It's always pre-selected. You're going to have an accountant field. You're going to have a place called notes. So just the word notes. You're going to get a, block, a blank box here, and you're going to double-click on it. You can also find this by pressing F11 and typing notes, and it's going to open up your notes box right away. So again, if I find notes, I'm going to double-click on it. It's going to say notes pertaining to a client. This is where I might do something like a carry forward amount because I want to show it for next year. So maybe this client in 2021 had some CRA interest. So I'll say taxpayer had CRA interest income in uh, received in 2022 in the amount of, let's say, $8.10. That's something that I want to make a note of now so that next year 
when I do their return next year and they come back to see me, I won't forget and I don't even have to go look at the notice of assessment because I know that it's there. When I put a note in the notes section, if I go to my page that I should be looking at, which is my notes and diagnostics page, it's going to show you all the notes up at the top. It's going to have that nice little paper clip icon and it's going to say, oh, here's something you might want to think about. Taxpayer had CRA interest income received in 2022, $8.10. That note will exist until I delete it. So next year when I go in, I have that note, I deal with the note. If I want to delete it, I can delete it next year. It's going to delete it from all the years. So this is a note that is attached to the client no matter which year we open up. Maybe I'm going to say something like uh, taxpayer, so I'm going to do notes here, tax Payer had medical expenses in 2021, and I'm going to list what they are, dental 400, and medical premiums 125 per month from, they have a new plan, it's going to be September to December not used in 2021. That might be a useful note for me there. Okay, and here we're going to go into my notes and diagnostics page. When I open the return next year, it should show up there. If it's not showing up right away, you're going to recalculate your client. So sometimes when you put a note in, it takes a little minute before it shows up. So then you're going to go tools, recalculate, or alt F9, and now it should have all of it there. And again, that's going to tell me next year, oh, let's make sure the client saved those receipts because if they did, I can go back and use them this year. Maybe I have medical last name. Yes, Anna Marie said, donations that you haven't used, wonderful place to put them because you don't have any way of tracking it. You're not going to get it on an autofill my return. You're not going to get it on anything else. And again, these are going to exist until someone deletes them. So they're just going to stay there. So make sure you only put something in here that you definitely want to see next year because it's, if it's something that's only relevant to the 2021 tax year, it's going to be really annoying if it just keeps showing up forever. All right, and Helene, will it show up when you open the file next year for moving expenses meals? Yes, so moving expenses for meals, if you do the little paper clippy note that I was showing you, instead of this one, if it's the paper clippy note, it's going to be attached to the 2021 data entry, which means when I open a new file in 2022, there won't be anything there because the data entry isn't there. But if I reopen that file from the 2021, if I change my tax year and go into 2021, the paper clip will still be there. So it will, it will attach itself to the data entry for that year and just stick with it. As compared to these notes, which are going to be in every year, no matter which year I open. Good. And then again, if you have a note in there and you have now used it and you don't need it to be there anymore, to make it go away, you're gonna double click on it again, you're gonna say clear and you're gonna say save and it's going to make it go away. Again, please, please do use these. It gives us information so we can do better returns for our clients. These are optional notes, but recommended as a way of keeping organized for yourself and keeping organized for your client without having to go pull a paper file and see if you wrote something down in the paper file, especially if you're working in a small office. So the small offices do not keep all of their previous re records in their little tiny office that does not have a big enough room for storage. They're lucky if they have room for the boxes they have to keep just for that year of tax returns. So if you have boxes for a client, uh, especially if you have really important notes in there, if you're in a small office, it takes a lot of time to go get that paper file. So it's really nice to have your notes in the computer because no matter which office your client goes to, they will have access to those notes if they're on the computer. All right, then we have the third one, and this one is going to be mandatory for some of your tax returns in this course. This is how we do notes annual. Notes annual is where we put notes that we want to explain this return, but the return as a whole, not necessarily just a single line on the return. So anything that's relevant to just this year. If I go into notes annual and I put something in notes annual in a 2020 return, it's not going to show up in 2021. If I put it in notes annual in a 2021 return, it's not going to show up next year. It's just going to be attached to that year. But it is going to have information that will help explain 
my return. And that's going to be one of our quality of source things that is now going to be mandatory for you to do. For every single practice problem you do and for your, your exam, we have a new rule for you, which is if you have a balance owing of $500 or more or a refund of $500 or more, you are now required to explain it to me. I need a list of everything that has created a balance owing or a refund of $500 or more. It is a requirement. So let's do that for, I think Dave Duncan is a good file. I'm going to do it for his 2021 return and what we need to do is generate a note. I'm going to show you my little tip and trick for how I do this so that I can type while looking at things. I like to use my notepad on my computer. If you have a notepad app, that's perfectly fine. I just need a tiny little text box that I can kind of drag around and make it small so that it's mostly out of my way. I'm going to go to the tax return. I'm going to look at my summary. I might do the comparative summary just because it puts it pretty much all on one screen for me. I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to say he had a refund more than 500. I have to explain that now. If you're explaining a refund, you're never going to put income as an explanation for a refund because income makes you owe more tax. When we're explaining a refund, we want to be looking at what deductions did he have, what unexpected non-refundable credits did he have, unexpected, not things the employer would, would have been expected to deal with, and what refundable credits did he have. So that's what we're going to look for when we're explaining a refund. Okay? Refund here, I can skip the fact that he had EI. That's not going to explain his refund. That's going to make it worse. But what are all the things that Dave Duncan did? For my notes, I like to say refund over 500. I just do the same format. I don't care what format you do, but I want you to do it. Why did he have it? Well, let's list everything. He had RPP. That is a deduction. A deduction is going to increase his refund. He had moving expenses. That is going to increase his refund. He had COVID work from home. So some combination of letters that everyone can identify is what you are talking about. So COVID work from home, I'm going to do this. Employment expense deduction. I'm going to scroll down again. No additional deductions here. So now we're going to look at what non-refundables credits he did. I always do this in order just because it's nice and you don't miss things. Remember CPP and EI are never going to explain a refund because the employer is the one who knows about them. Employment amount is expected. The employer knows about it. It's not going to explain a refund. But if he had had a first-time home buyer amount, that would be valid. If he had disability amount, that would be valid. If he had tuition transfers or if he had eligible dependent amount, all of those kinds of things, those are unexpected and those are non-refundable credits that will increase a refund. If he had donations, donations will increase a refund. If he had a dividend tax credit, that will increase a refund. If he had a CPP overpayment, which he did, that will increase a refund. If he had Canada workers benefit, if he had refundable medical expenses, if he had the teacher's school supply credit, whatever is showing up here is going to also increase his refund. I will say for an office, I would expect you to include provincial credits if there is a particular provincial credit, like you did the rent credit that's going to change things. So that would be your education property tax credit, but we call it the rent credit for convenience sake. That one I would want to see on this list. For the purposes of the exam, we're only going to do federal things so that we can mark everyone across the country the same way. But as a good practice, I would like you to have them in. So what I'm going to test you in this course, I will be asking you for provincial credits as well. And then I'm going to let you know what it would be for an exam. When you have everything together and these are all the things that are adding to his refund, I can look at this and go, now, does it make sense that he has a $2,000, $2,200 refund? Yes, that was a lot of deductions, a lot of extra things. So now I'm going to take this, I'm going to copy it into my, my clipboard. I'm going to go into my notes annual. You can use the keyword notes dash annual or go into your accountant section and find it. And I'm going to put it in here and I'm going to hit save. Okay. That way you can look at it on one screen, get your data in, and then put it into the computer. 
Now when I go to my Notes and Diagnostics page, I should have a summary of why he has a refund. Again, this is a requirement. Every file you do in a real office setting, if you have a balance of more than 500 or you have a refund of more than 500, we need you to tell us why, particularly if we're giving them instant refund and we're going to give them money and let them walk out with it and we're going to hopefully get that money back from the CRA later, you had better be able to explain why they're getting a big refund because we want to make sure they're actually going to get it. So in real life in an office, this is a requirement because it is so important, it's also going to be a requirement now. What that means for me is you're going to find that when I'm doing my answers from now on, so your practice problem answers starting from this chapter are going to have an additional note here which is going to say quality at source. I'm going to be asking you for how many check marks you have in your file. We'll talk about check marks in a minute. And I'm going to ask you if you need notes. So if you have a file that requires notes, I think one of them is going to be, oh, that's the answers. I don't want to give you the answers. This is the one I want to give you. If you have a file like Wayne Ramsey, it's going to have quality at source, three checks, and I'm asking for five notes. His refund is going to be quite big. So there will be five explanations that are correct for what they are, and I will also be testing some of them later. So I'm going to be asking you what are reasons for his refund. And that will mean five refunds. Yeah, five, five reasons for his refund. So in that case, there will be five that I'm expecting to see. There are right answers and wrong answers for this, so I want to make sure you have practice with it. If you want to practice it more, I'd like you to go back to the problems you've already done and apply your quality at source to them and see if you can explain your earlier refunds or your earlier balance owing. So why are those amounts? The answer should never be because the computer said so. That's not a good answer. If it's because less tax was deducted than should have been, why was less tax deducted than should have been? Why did the employer do it wrong? You need to have an explanation. It's not good enough to go, they didn't pay enough tax. Why didn't they pay enough tax? Did they have income that didn't have tax withheld from it? So we've done the incomes, the refund side. It's most common that we are explaining large refunds, but you have to be able to explain a large balance. So I'm going to show you the opposite side of things. How do we explain a balance owing? So EI benefits generally doesn't have enough tax withheld. EI benefits will increase the balance owing. Interest income, dividend income might increase the balance owing. You're adding income to return that hasn't had tax withheld from it. If you've received support that's taxable, that's going to increase your balance owing. If you have social assistance, it's not going to increase, or workers' comp, it's not because it's not taxable. So those you would not show up as an explanation. But any sources of income here, other income that's taxable that had no tax deducted, that will explain why you owe. Other things that might explain why you owe is if you have a repayment, if you had a clawback, an OAS clawback or an EI clawback, that's often going to require you to pay more money back. So you're going to owe this year. So you're going to look out for those things as well. And then the very last thing you'll have to do if you have no other explanation is look and see, did they have enough tax taken off by their employer? If their employer is undertaking tax off, that might be a reason why they owe money they should be contacting their employer and having more tax taken off next year. So in those circumstances, you might look at the tax slip, calculate what percentage of tax is being withheld, and if you want to know was it the right percentage, you can go down here and you can take a look at their marginal tax rate and average tax rate. If the employer is only taking off 12%, then you can see that their average tax rate is 20 and their marginal tax rate is 33, then 12% isn't going to be enough and they'll need to correct that for next year. So balance owing, make sure you can explain what's causing a balance owing, make sure you can explain what's causing a refund and an unexpected refund, and then make sure you add those to your notes. One more reminder, we're going to do this in notes annual, not in a check mark or in, um, in notes because we want to see it on the notes and diagnostics page, it needs to be there. When I'm looking and I have someone calling and saying, I didn't get the refund that was expected, and I want to know why they were thinking you were going to get that refund, I want to go to one place and have that answer really quickly. 
Or if I'm trying to process a very large refund for a client, I'm going to have to jump through some hoops to get that refund check cut for them. So then I'm going to have you know, block signal calling me and saying, uh, we're going to authorize you to do this, but you'd better be able to explain your return. I like to have that all in one place as well. So notes annual. Don't put it on regular notes because then it will be carried forward. We'll have to keep deleting it. And Helene, yes, in real life, these notes are required for every client if the refund is over 500 or the balance owing is over 500. Yep, it is, it is part of what we do in an office. It's part of what we should be doing in an office uh, because it is part of our quality of source of making sure we can explain the tax return. Okay. To show you a few other really fun things, then we'll take a break, and then we're going to come back and finish this. There are a few more very exciting things we're going to do here. Here's something you might find useful. If you are working on a return and you need a calculator quickly and your phone battery died so you can't do it on your phone and you're not sure if the desktop computer you have has a calculator function, you could press Control and Shift and C. And if you do that, you should get, which is going to jump up over here, a calculator. It's going to just pop up on your screen. So if you need a calculator quickly and you are in DT Max, Control plus Shift plus C will give you a calculator anytime you need one. In real life, most of us use our phones for calculators. A few people are old school and they like to have their solar panel powered desktop calculators, which is perfectly fine too. But if you're in a rush and you need a calculator really quickly, there's a function for you. Okay. Let's assume if we're in Dave Duncan's file, so you can try this yourself if you want to. We're in Dave Duncan's file. We had a combination of $290. Let's assume that that was not actually the case, and instead of one receipt with $290 on it, we had two receipts, okay? And the two receipts in this case are actually going to be, let me see if I can type these out for you. We had the Paradise Motel for $62, and they had the Pinewood Motor Inn for $68. So in a real setting, that was what we had for his travel accommodation. Okay, I think that's the one that I want. Yes, traveling costs. So traveling cost, instead of $130, I'm going to take the $130 out, and I'm going to say he actually had two receipts. What can I do with those two receipts on my desk rather than pulling a calculator out of my pocket and trying to add them up? Because it's simple math, I'm just going to do 68 plus 62. You can do the math in the computer if it's simple. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to hit tab, and it will calculate it for me, which is really, really nice. I don't have to do anything else. You can't, however, do multiple additions. So if I wanted to do 62 plus 68 plus another 100, it'll do it. There will be a limit to how many times you can do that. Okay. And then similarly, other math that you could do if you needed to, you can do simple division. You can do simple multiplication by using a star, and you can do subtraction. But again, if you start getting into very complicated strings of things, the computer will not do that for you. So I'm going to have everyone try this as you're going through. This is a time saver in the office because you don't have to pull anything out of your back pocket. You're just going to go, here we go. I've got two numbers. I can get the computer to do it. But again, if you're doing, you know, 50 little medical expense receipts, that's not going to be something that you're going to do here. I'll tell you what I do in those situations is I just open a spreadsheet. I do it in a spreadsheet, and then I can print that spreadsheet file later. And then if I have lots and lots of medical expenses that are not otherwise categorized, and I've done a bunch of calculations for travel expenses, medical travel, and things like that, I will then attach that spreadsheet to the file. Uh, in a different way rather than doing it in DT Max because that's too much typing. But if it's something basic and standard and I need to be able to look it up quickly, you can do the math this way. And then what you could do to explain where I got 130 from is you're going to put a note. What is my note? 
Paradise Motel. And actually, I'm going to cheat because I put it in the chat window, so I don't have to type it again. I'm just going to select my chat window data. I'm going to paste it in here. Oh, that's not going to my clipboard. I have to do it the slow way. All right, Paradise Motel 62 and Pinewood Motor in 68 equals 130. Where did I get those numbers from? If I need to find where I got those receipts from, I can ask the client. If he's lost them, he can go find them for me, and it should give me my check mark. except I hit clear and not save because I do that when I'm going quickly. So Paradise Motel 62 plus Pinewood Motor in 68 equals 130. I do that because in the old days the save button was here, <laughs> and then they moved it over here, and then I get confused. All right, so now if I have to go back to this file and I want to know why I got $130, where did it come from, I have my note, and the computer did the math for me. Any questions about our calculator, about our notes, about all of those things? Okay, play around with it a little bit, get used to it, see what happens. We're going to take a break again, just a short five minute break, and then we're going to jump into the rest of the quality of source that we need to talk about. Again, a few really critical things we're going to talk about after the break, so make sure you're back on time. Uh, if we're taking a five minute break, we're going to come back at 11.08. My audio wasn't on. Thank you very much, Helene. Yep, sorry, I just said a whole bunch of things and none of you heard it, so I'm going to say it again. All right, so here we go. Back to what I had said after the break. I had a few people who um, had questions about how to get their files back or how to send files to me, how to extract files. It's really important you have that. 
So if you are going to need to reinstall your software to update it correctly, or there's a problem with your software and you want to save the files you've worked on, make sure you stay for the end of class so I can show you how to do that extract file. And I'll make sure as well that I send instructions out to everyone so you have that. But, but stick around and make sure you're comfortable with it if you know that it's something you want to do. Or if you just want to send me a file you've worked on so that I can take a look at it, that extract option is going to be the easiest way of having me look at your work. Okay. We're going to jump in now, though, to quality at source, which is the next thing we have to do. In an office setting, in a real office, when you are working on a file, we have procedures in place to make sure we don't make the same mistakes or the common mistakes that happen all the time. So in an office, what we have when we do a client, we're going to enter all their information, we're going to do their tax slips, put everything in the computer that we want to do. We will not be able to generate a return until we have done double entry. So we don't have to double enter everything on the return, but there are some fields that are very commonly made where we make mistakes that are going to affect the tax return. Those ones are mandatory for us to double check. So it will require us to put their last name. It will require us to put their SIN number, their birth date, the tax year to make sure that we're in the right tax year will ask us what tax year are you trying to file and their postal code. All of those have to be typed in a second time into our double entry box and on their T4, we'll have to enter some of those boxes a second time. We'll have to type in their box 14, their box 22, and usually if they had a box 44, we'll have to enter that. There's a few other boxes that might be needed. And some of their other tax slips, if they had a T4A, there will be some boxes we will have to double enter. And that's because it is the most common mistakes that are made entering returns. They make us do it twice because if, if you're going to make a mistake, you're probably going to make a mistake once. And until they match, we can't generate a return in an office. So we have to do it and they have to match. We can't even see a return at all until we get that done. In this program, we don't have that. We don't have an option for you to double entry. So instead, we do expect you to check the same things that you should be checking, where in an office we will force you to check them whether you want to or not. So for part of what we're going to do is what's called our quality at source checklist. And this is something we have in every file that we do. If you have your inkling, I would like you to find illustration 18.1. Every file you do, you should complete your quality source checklist as a way of making sure you're not making the same mistakes that everybody else makes. So if you've entered a SIN number for a client before you finish the return, go to your checklist and say, yes, I did double check the SIN number, it's right. Did I spell their name right? It won't e-file if it's not spelled correctly. You're going to have to get them to come back in and re-sign all your documents if everything was signed with the wrong name. So make sure the client's name is spelled correctly before you file that return. You have to check the postal code, check the address as well, but check the postal code and double check your date of birth. The second part on this we're going to recreate for you in a kind of uh, just a method to make sure you're doing it. So this is something we are going to mark you on and something that I will be checking. Again, in your practice problem answers, when I give them to you, I'm going to tell you how many check marks I expect to see. When you're checking a tax slip, every tax slip you enter, so anything that's a T4, anything that's a T4A, a T4E, a T4A OAS, any tax slip at all that you enter, you must have a check mark on it to say I double checked the numbers. I'm going to show you where I want that check mark to be. So if you haven't been putting check marks on things to clear your warnings, now you have to clear your warnings. And you also have to do your double entry sort of practice solution. So this isn't a real double entry. I'm not going to make you type it twice, but I am going to make you check it. So if I was in Dave Duncan's file and I had entered his T4 from A and A, after I've entered it, I'm going to look, I'm going to clear my warning. If I had a warning, I'm going to put a check mark on it. And then I'm going to go down, double check all the numbers, make sure that they are right and that I have everything I need. Once I've done that, I'm going to pick the first line that has a number in it. In this case, it's the first line because it's our box 14 line, and I'm going to put a check mark on it. That check mark is what I'm going to call your quality at source check mark. Okay? If I had a different type of tax slip, like a T4E, I'm not going to necessarily have the check mark right at the top of the slip. I want it on the first line with numbers in it. So what I would do in the T4E, I'm going to do my data entry in a real office. It would require me to double enter some things on that slip. 
So for you, it's a tax slip. You have to double check your numbers. You're going to make sure they're right. If they're correct, pick the first line that has a number in it and put one check mark on that line. Again, just to make sure you are doing this and you are practicing it, in my solutions, I'm going to be telling you how many check marks that I want to see. That's the wrong one. Where is the one that I want? Chapter 18 practice problems. Let me pull those one up for you. So when I'm doing practice problems, you're now going to be asked for how many check marks. If you say QAS, one check. For Celine Davis, I'm expecting to see one tax slip with a check mark on it. If you need multiple check marks because they are necessary to clear a warning, you might need multiple check marks. Or if you have multiple tax slips, you will need multiple check marks because it's one for every tax slip that you enter. We do not need them for all of the receipts that you're entering or all of the extra lines. You don't need one on every line that you double check. You're just going to look at all of them and give me one check mark. Okay. Are there any questions about what I'm going to want for quality of source? So for Dave Duncan, if I was writing notes for you telling you what I'm looking for, I would say quality of source, I want one check mark plus one to clear the warning plus a check mark for the T4E. All of this data in here is not a tax slip, so I don't need check marks for any of that. So I would say quality of source, three check marks. And then notes, it would say, what am I going to do for notes? I want to have notes for why he has a refund. Okay, is it annual? So again, in a real office, we're not going to do this because in a real office, we have double entry, which does it for us. I will tell you in a real office, I do use the check marks when I'm doing very, very complicated returns. If I have lots and lots of tax slips and I'm amalgamating them and I'm double checking, did I download everything and did it match with what was on paper? I use those check marks to tell me these lines of data entry, I've double checked, these ones I'm still looking at just to keep track. So you can put these on and use them at your own in a real office. For the purposes of the course, however, every tax return you do, you need to do your quality of source. So if you're doing a 2020 tax return for a client, you need quality of source for 2020. That then the same client, you're going to do 2021 for them, you need to do quality of source again in 2021. Every tax return you do. Okay. There are other things on this checklist that you will do in an office setting that you should be thinking about when you're doing a return. If you're putting child support deductions on, do you have a copy of the court order? Can you prove it? If you're putting RSP contributions on, do you have receipts? If you're putting tuition fees, do you have T2202? If you're doing the transfer, did you fill out the back of the T22? This checklist is really helpful, especially for new associates, but really we should all be doing it. This checklist is helpful to make sure before you file that return that that return is audit proof, that when that return gets audited, you have everything you need that you are expecting to see. It's also going to have a few things that are mandatory. If you had a home buyer plan or lifelong learning plan, you have to confirm that you got that information from the CRA website and that it is correct. So you're going to make sure that you have that. It'll be in your autofill my return, but you're also going to be checking your rep client and seeing what is the history of this person's home buyer plan. Have I dealt with it correctly? Same thing, you're going to confirm your federal and your tuition, provincial tuition carry forwards, including if you're person was coming from a different province and now they're here, have I addressed the carry forward when I'm moving between provinces correctly? All of these things are just reminders of what I should be doing before I file the return. And then it's going to remind you, make sure it says ready for e-file. In your case, it will always say ineligible because we haven't set it up, but in a real office, you have to check that it's ready for e-file, that you have dealt with all of your warnings and your client has signed their paperwork. Are there any questions about how to do the double entry check marks or what I need for double entry check marks? Again, I'm going to remind you and I'm going to refresh it. And every problem you see now, I'm going to tell you how many check marks I want to see. And if you need notes, how many notes that I want to see. Okay. So that's the main part of our quality of source that you have to do. There's one more thing that we do in an office that is important that we have to talk about, which is what happens 
when we do autofill my return and what types of errors show up there and not just what types of errors show up, but what type of information shows up. So I'm going to do this a little bit out of order. I want to talk about autofill my return first. When we do autofill my return, we get our tax slip data and we also get limits like RSP limits. We get home buyer plan information. We get RSP carry forward information. We get tuition carry forward information. All of those things get populated directly into our returns. I'm going to show you how we do autofill my return. It's not going to work. So if you try to do this, it is not going to work at all because you're not set up for my account. You don't have represented client access and we shouldn't, we're not using real clients. So we shouldn't be doing this in a real office, but there are a couple of different ways to actually do autofill my return once you're in an office and it's set up. So I want to show you that at least once. This will be refreshed again if you end up working in an office and you want, this is going to be part of our on the job training and part of our great training as well for new associates. You're going to get to practice it in a real setting at some point, but I'm going to show it to you once now. When I do auto for my return, I do it from the client data entry screen because I want to make sure I'm on the right client. I don't want to be downloading somebody else's data into this person's return. That makes me really nervous because I can really mix things up. So when I'm doing auto for my return, I always start with the family head that I have, double check their name, that it is the year that I want to do, that I'm in the right place. And then what I can do for autofill my return is I go over to the right side here where we can do our drop down boxes. And instead of choosing carry forwards or things like that, I want to download the T slips from the CRA. So if I click on T slips from the CRA, I'm going to get this dialog box and it's going to say, how many people's returns do I want to access? It's going to give me a list of them. If I have multiple family members, I might want to do multiple family members because I'm doing Duncan and if, or Dave, and if he had a spouse, I might be doing him and his spouse. I'm going to make sure that I'm only looking at the people I have authorization to look at. You have to be careful here in an office. If you have, for example, a university-age student who's attached to their file, but they're an adult and you haven't talked to them about whether or not they want you to look at their tax situation, you should not be downloading information for them without their permission. But if you've decided, yes, Dave wants me to do his return, he's given me authorization to do this, I would then say retrieve information. What it would do is it's going to take me to the CRA website, require me to put in my personal login information for a client, verify that I have access, that this person has granted me the authority to do this, and then it's going to say thinking, and then it's going to say file, next files complete or something along those lines, and all of a sudden I'm going to have all kinds of data on the right side here, and I can then copy information over. Again, I've showed you how to copy information over. In a real world setting, if I wanted to copy in, maybe he had another T4 from my autofill my return, I would select the top and the bottom until I've highlighted everything I want, and I'm going to copy everything over to the left. Then I have to do double entry. So in real life, I would then have to do double entry on the boxes, which even though I didn't type them, the computer wants me to make sure that I copied them over correctly, so it will make me do that. Autofill my return, however, can have some flaws, so I do want to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to delete this now because I don't want it to copy it over. I'm going to clear my marks. Autofill my return is only as good a tool as the person using it, so after you've copied it over, your next job is to go down and confirm that those returns make sense. There are a lot of typical errors that happen when you do a download. And it's not because you did anything wrong, it's because the employer might have done something interesting, it's because you, there, there may be uh, slips that have to be kind of dealt with or addressed or things have to be changed or there are numbers that shouldn't be there. So your job is to go through your autofill after you copied everything over and see what do I need to correct. I'm gonna give you some examples. If you have an employer who doesn't know what they're doing, when they want to leave something blank and they're doing their data entry on their screen as an employer doing payroll, they might put zeros in those boxes. So sometimes when we do an autofill my return for someone like this, what it would look like, I'm just going to do it this way, if I'm doing my autofill and I copy it over, it might have, instead of blank 20 boxes, which should have had numbers in them because he's not exempt, they may have accidentally put zeros in. That's not correct. If I look at the tax slip that I have in front of me, the tax slip just left them blank, 
and it should be the box 14. But the computer has now been told that they weren't eligible for CPP or for EI, and it's now going to give a really nice big CPP overpayment or EI overpayment that does not make sense. So when that happens, and it does happen in auto file return, you have lots of small employers who don't know how to fill out their payroll correctly. When they do their automatic filling with the CRA, they put some interesting information in there. We would come to this and go, that doesn't make sense, confirm that it's not what's supposed to be there, and we would have to take the zeros out. So little things like that can be a problem. Sometimes you have someone who is exempt. Maybe they're exempt from CPP, I mean exempt from EI because they're working for a family business. So they won't put in an EI figure, but they, the employer doesn't know they need to tick the exempt box. Sometimes we have to correct that. Okay. Sometimes you'll have T4s that are absolutely correct, or T4As that are absolutely correct, but the computer requires you to make an adjustment for it. So I'm going to give you an example there. What if he had a patronage allocation? If he had a patronage allocation from a co-op, he might have had, let's say, $100 of patronage allocation and $10 of tax withheld from it. We see this in Manitoba all the time. When you do the autofill my return, it's going to do the download and it's going to put it in box 30, but it's going to put it in the box 30 that is taxable. Does anyone remember going all the way back to the beginning of the course, whether or not patronage allocations are taxable to not self-employed people. T4A, patronage allocation box 30. If you're a member of a co-op and you're using it for personal use, it's not taxable. The download automatic default will put it on the taxable line. When you finish your autofill my return, you're going to go through and go, oh, he's got a tax slip from a co-op. Okay, this number should be on this line which is my patronage not taxable line. So I have to go in and move that number to make it not taxable. Otherwise, you're going to add income to his return that shouldn't be there. The slip has to be there, so you have to enter the slip. If you don't enter the slip, he's not going to get his $10 credit for the tax that was paid on his behalf. So you have to enter the slip, but you're going to have to manually change it from taxable to not taxable. We see this one all the time. So that's a very common thing we have to check when we do auto fill my return. Okay, a couple of other things that are going to happen where the auto fill will be correct, but the computer will not necessarily know what it's doing. I might have a T4 RSP slip, and the T4 RSP slip, this isn't going to work in this case because I'm in Dave and we don't have a family yet, but if I have a T4 RSP slip and he had a spouse, so it has a box 24 said the spouse, and the spouse had a SIN number in there, and he had taken money out, and the amount that came out came out of box T4 RSP withdrawal. That's going to be, uh, which box do I want? I want box 18. Oh, no, I want withdrawal, box 22. If I had a withdrawal, it's going to download as a withdrawal. It's going to say 5,000. If that was supposed to be an early spouse withdrawal, I'll teach you the data entry for that later. The computer would not automatically identify for you that there was an early spousal withdrawal. You would have to go in at this point and you would have to say, this is actually a different scenario and I'm going to change this from a regular withdrawal, which is going to be the default, and I'm going to have to change it to an early withdrawal. I'm going to refresh that when we get to spouses and things like that, but that's something that I want to make sure that you're aware of. You can have done the data entry correct or done the autofill transfer exactly correctly, but you have to go look at that slip and make decisions about whether or not there's a different issue there so that you can change the box to trigger the forms that you want the computer to have. Okay, I'm going to take this one out. I'm just showing you some things so that you can visually see it on your computer of what it's going to look like. I'm going to take the co-op slip out. So those are very common things. A few other things that will happen when you have T3s and T5s, so those are your investment slips. A lot of times T3s and T5s your client will have one slip. They will have one nice summarized slip, everything in one place. And then when you go and do the download, you're going to have four or five slips and lots of little bits. And your job now is to look at all of those slips and say, is it all from the same place? If it's all from the same place, maybe it's from TD Bank. 
You're going to go through and you're going to add all the columns together and you're going to see if it matches the one physical copy that your client gave you. If it's the same, then you can amalgamate the slips so that the computer is only a dealing with one tax slip. As long as the numbers match, it will still work when you do your matching with the CRA. If the numbers don't match, you're going to have to find out is this T3 you're holding an additional slip to be added to the other ones or is it partly included? You have to make sure you're not duplicating things but that you're including everything that needs to be there. So T3 slips often you'll have in pieces. You might have the same thing with T5008. So if they are going to be doing lots of sales of shares, the client might only have one summary slip but the CRA might have a recorded transaction for every time it happened, depending on how they got the information. You can do an autofill my return and it'll download 15 different slips that can all be collapsed into one. So one of your jobs is going to be verifying all the income and then simplifying it if it's appropriate. Okay. A couple of other things that might happen. They might have so many slips that they can't be downloaded. I have definitely had that happen with some of my clients where you will have pages and pages and pages of tax slips that the CRA has. And when you do your autofill my return, you're going to get an error message going, we couldn't do this. There are too many slips. Those are fun. You get to print them all and then do that return by hand. So super fun. Hopefully, if that happens to you as a new associate in an office, you're going to go find someone like me and make that my headache and not your headache. But it is something that happens when you do autofill my return. A few other things, if you have a T5 slip or a T3 slip, remember it might be reported in a different currency. When you do the autofill my return, the CRA will not tell you what currency it should be and you're going to have to look at the slip itself, identify the currency, and if it was reported in US dollars, you're going to have to reflect that. I'll be teaching you how to do that later in the computer, but that's a very common thing that gets missed when we do autofill my return. Or RSP deduction limits, it will have the deduction limit, but sometimes the undeducted RSP contributions don't match what we need them to be. You may need to dig into that as well. So everything you do on autofill my return is your starting point. Then you need to verify what you're doing. Okay. And if there are unnecessary zeros when you do the autofill because the employer put unnecessary zeros in, make sure you take those zeros out. If it should be blank, leave it blank. If it should be zero, it needs to be zero, so you'll have to make a judgment call on those ones. Are there any questions about how this works? So we do autofill my return, copy everything over, do our double entry, then we go through and we verify the information that we copied over and amend anything we have to amend. And there's a list of this in your book as well if you have more questions. And the checklist is also going to help you. Did you verify the income on the slips? Okay. One more thing happens when you do autofill my return, which is really, really useful, is you're going to get what we call send data, okay? The reason it's called send data is in the old days before we had RepiCline and autofill my return, we had to do a process called a send code, which was every return we did, we would check with the CRA to find out if they had any debts or anything else that was going to prevent them from getting their refund. This has now been amalgamated in with autofill my return. So it's all part of the same process, but it's still going to show up in our program as send data. And this shows up after we do it in our sort of accounting section, under our, under our e-file section. It's going to show up in our computer there. You're not going to see it until you do a real client, but in a real office, every time you do autofill my return, you want to look at the send data and find out what it means. So we have an example in illustration 18-2 of what that looks like. I want to have you tell me what this data means. So how do we know what all of these codes and things are telling us? So normal at the top, it's going to say, note, it might be incomplete. Please double check the CRA. They don't promise that they have everything in there. So it's going to warn you that. You don't have to worry about that. The top ones are important. It's going to tell us, is the client currently in bankruptcy? If they're in bankruptcy, that's not a level one return. We may not be able to file that return, or if we can file it, you need a specialist for that one. So you want to verify your client's not currently in, in, in bankruptcy. It's going to tell you if it has different types of outstanding returns. Are there things that it needs to file that are going to delay its return? So maybe it has some GST returns. Your client is self-employed, and they should have been filing GST returns, and they haven't. It's going to give you a warning about that. 
So the first couple of warnings are not going to be very relevant for you as new clients because you're not going to help self-employed clients. But then we're going to get to the ones that you do have to care about, which is number one, have they already filed this year? Because if they've already filed 2021, you can't file another 2021. The best you can do is an adjustment. So the first thing you're going to check is have I filed a return for this year already? And they're going to say no. So current year return. The next one it's going to say is do they have a balance owing? This balance owing is for your CRA taxes. So in this particular circumstance, you have a client, they're filing their return, but they already owe $368 to the CRA. If they're getting a refund this year of let's say $400, what will happen to that refund when they file this year's return? Will they get $400 or less than $400? They will deduct it. So you don't want to tell a client they're going to get $400 if they're actually going to get $30. You're going to tell them, oh, I noticed that you have a debt with the CRA. Let's find out where that debt came from. Maybe we can help. But if that debt is a valid debt and we can't change it, you need to be aware you're going to get a refund this year. It's going to pay off your debt. And then you'll have a little bit left over. Good. Let's talk about the next one. So I'm going to circle some things here and I'd like you to tell me what you think they mean. So I'm going to annotate for myself. And I'm going to circle the first one. I'm going to give you actually give you this one here. So this one here, this line where it says send reassess progress. Yes, 2018. What does that mean? What is the CRA currently in the process of doing? They are currently reassessing the 2018. It hasn't been reassessed yet, but they have been requested for an adjustment. So this means your client asked for an adjustment to their 2018 return that has not yet gone through. When it goes through, it might affect things. So if you're planning on having a really big refund for them, but you don't know if the 2018 assessment is going to cause a balance owing and it's going to get processed before yours gets processed, you need to be aware that there is a, reassess a, a reassessment process. Find out from the client what they're reassessing, what's being reassessed, and see if it's something that's going to affect you this year. Good. What about the next one? This is going to say that there was send reassessment, and it's going to say, a date, 2209-2020, and it's going to have a number or a year, 2016. What's that telling me? It's going to say they finished an assessment of 2016. So they have reassessed 2016. Probably, I will tell you from doing this a bunch of times, probably this balance owing was created by this reassessment. That would be my guess. But at this point, rather than guessing, I would be going in to rep a client and I'd be trying to figure out what happened with this client. Because if they were reassessed in 2016, they're currently being reassessed for 2018. Something's going on. Did the client forget something and now they're fixing it? Did the CRA catch something and now they're going and changing it? I want to make sure I don't make the same mistake again. So I'm going to go look into those reassessments and see what happened. And sometimes this happens because clients didn't answer their letters. So a lot of times when we get these send codes, It'll say reassessment from this date, balance owing. They're going to say, I have no idea what that's about. I didn't even know I owed money to the CRA. You're going to look into it. You're going to look at the reassessment. It's going to say, we reassessed you because you did not answer our letter dated whatever, where we asked you to send us your union dues. And I'm going to go, huh, do you have a receipt for those union dues? And they're going to go, yeah. And I'm going to send them in. And then they're going to get their $368 back. So when we have a reassessment, we can look at it and see is this something we can change. Sometimes we can't fix it. Sometimes they did do something they weren't supposed to do. All right. Then we have, those are all tax debts. So everything we've done up till now has been debts that are connected to the tax return itself, a refund or a balance owing for a specific tax year. Then we have all of these, which are debts to other government organizations. So let's see if we can identify some of these. This one here, if you have a refund set off means a debt, you have a debt with CCB, what does that mean? Who does the client have to pay money back to? Canada Child Benefit. 
sometimes they will take that debt from your refund. Sometimes they'll take it from your next Canada Child Benefit payment. So there will be a repayment of Canada Child Benefit that is required, and it will tell you how much. Good. Let's see if we can guess the next one. And I'm going to give you a clue here. It has to do with students. So who would you have a debt to with the initial CSL if you are a student or you were a student? Canada Student Loan. Canada Student Loan, if you don't pay your Canada Student Loan, they can take your tax refunds until it's paid off. So you need to be aware if you have a student loan debt that you have not paid, it's gonna show up here because it might affect whether or not they get their refund. It's not guaranteed, but they can take your refund to pay your student loan or they can take part of it. All right, next one, we have EMPL, $635. Can anyone guess who they would owe with this case? This is EI, EI benefits. If you owe employment insurance, then it will have an EMPL code. You can find all of this from RepaClient. So if you don't know what the code is for, you can go into RepaClient and look for debts through there, and they will also have more detail, including, in most cases, a more accurate number. Sometimes we will know that there's a debt but not have a number when we do AFR. Sometimes there will be a number, but it's not current to the with in, in you know interest on it as well you can always go into repa client and find more detail if there isn't more detail what there will be is a phone number it will be you have a debt with such and such government organization if you have questions call this number you can then give that information to your client good let's do a few more what about this one here this client has a debt to gstc What are they having to repay? What benefit did they receive that they have to pay some back for because they had the wrong amount of income? GST. Good. In this case, it probably came from the same reassessment that's caused all this other difficulty. If we changed their income in 2016 and they were getting Canada Child Benefit and they were getting GST, it's going to change all of those things as well. Good. I'm going to keep going down. Uh, and the last thing that you always want to look for is do they have any unfiled returns? If they have unfiled returns, there may be a benefit to filing them. So you want to check and see, 2019, you didn't file a return. Would you have gotten a benefit if you had filed one? Do you want to file it now? I will do that one for you. We do this for our clients all the time. They may not know they've missed a return. They may not know that they had benefits they could have claimed if they filed a return. This will tell us which returns are done and which ones aren't. If there's a reason why they haven't filed it that's a good reason, you want to make sure that you know that as well, and I would put a note in the file. So I have clients who are newcomers to Canada. They have lots of unfiled returns because they weren't in the country and they weren't resident in Canada. They didn't have to file a return in Canada, and they get no benefit from it. I would then make notes in my file of which years are unfiled and why. If I don't have a good reason and they're going to get benefits, most of the time we can convince our clients to file because we go, look, if you file this return, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get your GST, you're going to get your refund, whatever it is, and then we can catch our clients up. So we always check that as well. So the send code will have all of these things, and then you're going to have your actual tax slips. You're going to copy them over. You're going to verify them. You're going to do your double entry. For you, that means you're going to do your check marks. Then you can do your return. When your return is done, if you have a refund or balance of more than 500, you need to give me some notes for why. few more things that I want to mention that are in this chapter that are useful for you. Remember that CPP and EI are statute barred in the long run if you are doing old returns. If it's more than three years, you cannot get an EI overpayment. If it's more than four years, you cannot get a CPP overpayment. The computer might warn you about it, might. It doesn't always. It depends on the year. But whether it warns you or not, you have to do it manually. So I want to show you how to do it manually, unfortunately. You do have this in the book that will tell you what to do, but this is one that we just kind of have to make it happen. So if I have a client with lots of tax slips, let's say he has all of these tax slips, now I have a really big overpayment because this person took the maximum off and that person talk, took even more off. I'm going to get a warning telling me I have an overpayment. 
I'm then going to have to go in and change the return by the amount of the overpayment. So let's make this a little bit simpler. I'm going to take this out because I added this data in. You can watch and follow along and you can practice this on your own as well. If you have a client that has a CPP overpayment, see if you can figure out how to take it out. What I like to do when there is an overpayment is I like to have the computer tell me how much that overpayment is going to be. So if I was in here and let's say his employer had done 6206.45, the computer is going to tell me that can't be right. They shouldn't have done that and I'm going to have a warning. I know it should have been 3133.75. That's what it should have been. So all I have to do is do the math to take that out or if it's not as simple as it's the maximum, what I'm going to do is go to my final line here. CPP overpayment is $72.70. I know that I can't have $72.70 because I'm not entitled to it because I'm doing an old year. I'm going to write that number down, go back to my data entry, pick my largest CPP contribution, whichever tax slip has the most on it, go find that box, and I'm going to use my calculator to subtract $72.70 and I'm going to do that until I go to my, C, my CCP overpayment line and it's gone. So I want to make sure it's zero. Okay, so you're going to go in and you're going to amend the slip. Remember, income we can't reduce unless we have a good reason. So box 14 you should never amend with the one exception of wage loss replacement plan and there's instructions for that. But generally speaking, if it's income on a slip, you can't change it because the CRA will adjust it for you. You can always claim less for deductions and less for expenses if you want to. That's optional. So even though the slip would have had a higher number in it, I'm only going to report the amount that I'm allowed to report to make the CPP overpayment go away. Any questions about that? Yes, and add a note. So if I have changed that slip, I would absolutely be going in here and I would say, why did I do that? I would say box 16 equals 3206, whatever I said it was, 75 CPP overpayment is statute barred at time of filing, something like that. I would hit save, and then if someone went back and said, why didn't you give me my CPP overpayment, the computer said I could have one, I would go and go, what did I do? And then I would look at my note and I would go, oh yeah, well, that's, that's why I did it. <laughs> it's because you filed it more than four years late, you don't get it anymore. And then the client says, oh, okay. So anytime you do a change, absolutely, to a tax return, to a, to a slip of any kind, put nope. All right. A couple more things that I want to talk about, which is e-filing. How do we e-file a return? Remember, it's required by the CRA to e-file if it's eligible to be e-filed. If you need a refresher for which returns can and can't be e-filed, you're going to find that information in your textbook here, and you're going to find that information in the earlier chapters, the administrative chapters that we had just finished doing. When you are excluded from e-filing, for you, as a level one, as a brand new associate, most of the time, you can e-file if it's current year or one of the one of the more recent years. So right now, we can e-file everything back to 2016. Older returns have to be paper filed. Eventually, they may update that to the point that we can e-file everything. But right now, we can go back to 2016. All of the rest of the ones in here that are things that have to be paper filed, you can't do those returns. So if they are deceased, you can't do it. If they're deemed resident, that's more complicated. If they're bankrupt and we're doing a pre-bankruptcy or a post-bankruptcy or an in-bankruptcy return, you can't do that one. If they're an emigrant or a non-resident, they're leaving the country, or if we're doing a non-resident return, you can't do that one. Immigrant returns, newcomers to Canada, people coming in, can be e-filed and therefore must be e-filed. There is legislation that says if it's eligible for e-filing, you have to e-file it. If you don't, there's a penalty. So anyone who paper files a return that could be e-filed is going to have a $25 penalty um, administered by the CRA. 
Okay. And then the one that you are going to have that is not eligible is if you're doing voluntary disclosure program. So if you have a client who needs the voluntary disclosure program, you will be preparing paper returns for that client. Even for the years that could have been e-filed, those ones have to be paper. Other than that, e-file every return that you possibly can. If you're doing an older return, 2015 or earlier, that will be paper filed. Okay. And again, farming returns, you're not going to do farming returns. Um, you're not going to be doing ones with very, very complicated corporate and scientific income on it. Um, in research and development for specific provinces, you're not going to be doing. So most of these exceptions will not apply to anyone in this class. Okay. In order to file a return, it must say that it is ready for e-file. I'm going to show you this here because I can't show it to you on my screen. In real life, what I would do if I wanted to file a return, I'd go into the return. I'm going to double check all of my numbers to make sure they make sense. The last thing I'm going to do is go to Notes and Diagnostics and make sure it says eligible for e-file. It has to say eligible for e-file. Then I go up to e-file and I'm going to pick the little box that says transmit and receive. I can't do it right now because it's turned off, but what it would look like is it's going to say, do you want to send the current client? Always do one client at a time. Don't e-file a whole family. You want to do those last minute checks before you're done and you want to make sure you're not accidentally filing somebody else's return who hasn't signed what they need to sign. So do them one at a time. Current client, federal, continue. Then it's going to give you a little status thing. It's going to tell you, you have filed that return. We have received the return for such and such a person. If there's an issue, like you have been selected for pre-assessment and there's going to be a delay, it will tell you that when you e-file it as well. But most of the time, it's just going to say that your return has successfully been filed with the CRA. And then you're going to have, hopefully, a little code in your computer that's going to say e-file and it's going to update your status. If it didn't go through, if there was an e-file error, you will get an e-file error code. It will say there's a problem and that code number can be looked up. We have books that tell us what those codes mean and they're going to give you details. So if you ever e-file a return and you get a warning, print that warning. It's going to tell you what you have to fix. It's going to tell you you had an error with the name. You had an error with the postal code. You were missing the home buyer plan that we know that you had, so we didn't accept your return. If there's an e-file code, you have to correct it, get a new signature on your signature forms so the client has the new updated figures, and then send it again. Okay? So if you have an e-file error, there is a filing manual there. It's going to tell us what all of the errors mean, um, and then you have to fix it and do it again. I'm going to show you what some of the forms look like that we sign, and I also want to introduce you to the e-file section of our data entry. So if I do the code e-file, it's going to give me, that's not the right code, let me find it here. Uh, if I do e-file and discounting is what I want, e-file without the hyphen. If I do e-file and discounting, it's going to give me my, my drop-down boxes here. Generally speaking, in an office setting, we just say yes if eligible, which is the default. There is one that is for yes even if ineligible. Don't do this because it will allow you to generate things, but it won't actually go through. And then if you want to make it a paper return, and it could have been e-filed, make sure you have a good reason for doing that. You're going to say, no, don't e-file it. I want it to be paper. I'm going to show you even if ineligible for now because I want to show you what the forms look like. So if we were going to e-file this return, we would have to get a signature from the client on a form called a T183. T183 looks like this. It's going to have Dave Duncan. I'm going to have to fix that city because I typed it wrong. It's going to have their refund line and their total and taxable income. It's going to have a couple summary things here. And then it's going to have B as the electronic filer or H&R block with an e-file number. And then it's going to say, I want paper assessments unless I've signed up for online mail. If I've signed up for online mail, I'll have a tick box here. If I had previously been signed up, I'm going to teach you how to do that data entry in a future class. If I had previously been signed up, I'm going to tick this box here. And then they're going to sign it, and then we're going to have a date. And then whatever that date is, I have to keep that in my records. I keep a paper copy. My client gets a paper copy. Then I can e-file. You never e-file without having this signed. Once it's e-filed, 
it's going to change the status here. So if it's ready to e-file and you haven't done it yet, it's going to say ready to e ready for e-file in your status. So if you go to the client list, you can see your status, it'll say ready for e-file. If I've chosen to do a paper return, it's going to say data OK or ready to print. Then when I print it, I have to tell the computer that I've mailed it. So if I've e-filed it, once it's done, the status is going to change from ready for e-file to e-filed. It will tell me that it's e-filed and it'll tell me what date I e-filed it. If I've mailed it, I have to tell the computer that I mailed it. So if I'm mailing a return, I'm going to go into the client and I'm going to click on status information. So this little I here, this is all in your textbook. You can find copies and pictures of it there. And I have to say what date I mailed it, tick the box, and tell them that I actually did put that in the mail. Okay. And just a reminder, if you are mailing a return and you need to know how to assemble it and how to put it together, at the bottom of any paper return you generate, there will be assembly instructions. So down at the bottom, you're going to have how to assemble it. It's going to tell you where to send it to. It's going to tell you what signatures you have to have. It's going to tell you what order to put things in. Remember the bottom page, the very last page, you need to flip it over so it turns it into a little booklet and it has to be signed. Okay. So that's how you're going to do e-filing in real life, transmitting a return. If you get an error, it's going to tell you how to fix it. It's going to tell you what signatures you need. Don't forget, you have to send your T1135 separately, so you're going to do the same thing again. It's going to tell you about paper filing. I have three minutes to teach you about direct deposit, and then I think we're done. Okay, so three minutes for direct deposit. Let's talk about that. In the old days, we could update our clients' direct deposit information for them when we filed their return without having to do anything else. That has gone out the window since COVID happened because there were a lot more security procedures put in place. So now if the client wants to change direct deposit information, they have different options. These are all in your book, so I would make a note of that page as well. They can file through my account. If they have my account, they can change their direct deposit info themselves. They can do it over the phone, but they will need their current tax return to get through the ID verification process. They can do it at their bank or financial institution. These are all fast methods of getting direct deposit set up. So if they need direct deposit set up right away before their return is processed so they get their refund direct deposited, that's how I would recommend doing it. If those are not options for them or that sounds like too much work for them and they don't want to do it, we can do a paper form for them which then has to get mailed into the CRA. So to do direct deposit, let's assume that Dave Duncan would like to sign up for direct deposit. In that case, I'm going to give you some information here and we have a keyword called direct, okay? Direct will take you to direct deposit. They're going to choose what they want to direct deposit. Do they want their federal return or federal in Quebec? We're going to do federal return. It's going to ask for the branch number and it's going to ask for the financial institution and the account number. I'm going to give you two of those. So I'm going to tell you that the branch is 45678. And I'm going to tell you that the account number is, make sure I type this correctly, 5060908. Okay, so you can put those numbers in. I can put, ooh, what did I say it was? 45678. If your client doesn't know their financial institution number, there's a really nice thing here called a help file. I show this every year, and my senior associates go, oh, that would have been very useful to know. If you use your help button, it will tell you, oh, look, I need to know which bank it is. And if I told you that they are at the Bank of Nova Scotia, that's going to tell me that the code is 002. So if they're Bank of Nova Scotia, we need a financial institution number, which in this case is 002. If you do this, I would like you to double check it, and then I'm going to ask you to have the client check it. Because if you direct deposit into the wrong account, that money is now in that account and the client may have a difficult time getting their money back. So you're going to put it in, you're going to double check your work, then you're going to ask your client to verify the numbers so that you know for sure that you are putting in the number they gave you. If they've made a mistake, that's on them. But that you want to make sure you're not making a mistake with this. When you do that, 
you're going to have a direct deposit form. So you're going to notice somewhere above your moving expenses in the middle of all your documents, you're going to find a direct deposit enrollment form. It's going to have personal information in here, and then it's going to have, I want to do all of my CRA stuff. If they want to have their CPP or their OAS direct deposited, they have to do a different form with Service Canada, so we won't be doing that for them on this form. It's going to have their banking information. You will have to add a void check, or if they don't have a void check, they have to then take this paper form and go to a bank and get a stamp. I'm going to tell you, if your client's doing that, just have them have the bank do their direct deposit for them because it's faster. The bank can do it automatically once they've verified their ID. This one you have to do by paper. So we're going to print it out, attach a void check, sign the last page. If there's a legal rep signing, we need the legal rep information. And I would, keep a, I would attach a copy of the power of attorney to it just so they have everything they need. Then the signature of the person, and it's going to tell you you're going to mail this to Quebec and you're going to wait for them to process it. And eventually, they'll be signed up for a deposit. So like I said, we can do it for our clients, but this is not the fast way of doing it. If our client wants this, make sure that they go to one of the other methods first. If that's not an option, we do this for them. All right, that's it. We are done. Congratulations. I will be sending out the answers for these chapter problems. Remember, quality of source is now important. You will be marked on it, so I want you to practice it. You have three practice problems to do for next Monday.